do introductions because I think that would be helpful for discussions. <laughs> um, okay, I'll start. I'm Christina McCluskey. I'm a project scientist in the CGD lab, um, and I study aerosol cloud interactions in polar regions. And then we'll head over to Simone. Simone Tillman is from ACOM, interested mostly in aerosol and the global model in aerosol cloud. So I'm interested to learn more about cloud processes in this meeting. I'm Vivek uh, from Earth Observing Laboratory. I'm a scientist working uh, radar and radar emergency of clouds and precipitation. I'm Cici Chen. I'm a project scientist at RHEL, and I'm working on clouds and precipitation, mostly working uh, on WARF. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to see all of you here. I'm Wojtek Grabowski. I'm a senior scientist at MCUBE, uh, about to retire, by the way. So uh, I'm happy to be senior scientist still, because I think we have some changes coming. I uh, also clouds, cloud dynamics, microphysics, all those things. I'm Yaga Richter. I'm from the directorate. I'm here to learn about what you're all doing in cloud aerosol interaction. So thanks for having me. Thanks. Ting Liu from University of Oklahoma. I work with Dr. Greg McFarquhar and Docs. Uh, Dr. Christina McCloskey at NCAR CGD. Um, I work on aerosol clouds and precipitation over the Southern Ocean, particularly in boundary layer. Thank you. Um, I'm Milena Korkos. I'm working at Northwest Research Associates, just facing the building over there. And I'm interested in tropical cirrus clouds and interaction with gravity waves. I'm Bernd Kercher. I'm a guest here at MCubed. So uh, from DLR in Germany. And I'm working on cloud on, on ice microphysics, especially, and the coupling with turbulence. I'm Hugh Morrison, and <clears throat> excuse me, in M cubed, and I uh, work on cloud microphysics and dynamics, um, especially modeling and cloud parameterizations. Thanks, Hugh. Um, I'm Sarah Woods. I'm within EOL, but I work out at the Research Aviation Facility overseeing the suite of in-situ cloud probes out there. Um, most of my research focuses on serious microphysics and mixed phase clouds. Uh, I'm Chen Chen Liu. I'm working for Brand2 at the border. I'm also a visitor here uh, to work with Simon. We are working on the Karma aerosol and cloud model. Currently, we are uh, evaluating the Karma cloud model and we hope to release the curves at the end of this year. Hi, my name is Troy Zaremba. Um, I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Washington. Um, I, my research is primarily focused on radar and uh, cloud microphysics, and I'm here this month working with uh, Sarah Tessendorf on some snowy research. <coughs> I'm Yuki Kano. I'm a visitor at MCUBE uh, from, um, from uh, Central Research Institute of Electric Power Industry in Japan. I'm studying uh, uh, cloud microphysics, especially the uh, wet snow accretion onto the uh, electric power lines. Hi, I'm Ishii. I'm a PhD student from the University of Oklahoma. I'm a visitor here. Uh, I do ensemble forecasting and also cloud microphysics. I'm here to uh, work with Truda, Christina, and Hugh. And we are working on uh, secondary ice production processes, and we plan to implement that in, in, in WARF model. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm Ricky Romerschke. I'm a project scientist in EOL. And I'm also the scientist for the HyperCloud Radar. And so most of what I do is data processing, quality control, and development of radar algorithms and retrieval algorithms for microphysical processes. Wait, Rachel, you can introduce yourself, too. <laughs> She's our hero. <laughs> I'm Rachel McLawrence, and I'm an admin, and I helped uh, put this on. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm Trude Hammer, I'm a project scientist in RAL, and I'm working on microphysical schemes modeling in both global models and regional scale models. I'm interested in both warm clouds and cold clouds. 
Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I think we have representation from CGD, EOL, ACOM, and RHEL, and M cubed, right? Did I say M cubed twice? No. Okay. That's great. Okay. So this is good. It's growing. Um, so welcome on behalf of myself, Cece, and Truda, um, people who are trying to organize aggregates. Um, as a reminder, this is just an initiative um, to build community and foster cloud microphysics research at NCAR. Um, I, we've had two workshops so far, and we wanted to give an update, or sorry, there's an agenda here. We're going to have about a 30-minute discussion kind of update uh, period, and then we're going to have a bunch of different talks covering a wide range of topics. It might be a little bit jumpy, but that's okay. That's kind of where we are right now, right? Um, so we have three talks and then a break, and then we'll have some more talks in the afternoon, and then we'll follow it up with some more discussion, maybe coming back to some of our discussion topics that we start out with. So our quarter two workshop was intended to think about how um, the cloud microphysics community at NCAR can contribute to the SPAT roadmap. So for those of you who aren't familiar, SPAT is the Earth System Predictability Across Timescales project that Yaga is leading. And this is um, an effort to think about the different strategic priorities for NCAR. And Yaga is here to answer any questions about that. <laughs> um, she did volunteer to do that, so thank you, Yaga. Um, but what we did last workshop is basically think about um, two main topics that we talked about in breakout sessions. First of all, what are the scientific grand challenges and key science questions that would fall under this Earth system predictability across time scales? And then the other thing we thought about was what can we do here at NCAR right now? What are the ab approaches that we um, have and we can apply to these uh, key questions? And really the goal of this was to provide a concise message for Yaga so that Yaga is not bombarded with 10 different opinions. We try to pull um, some sort of consensus um, on behalf of this microphysics community. We passed this around and got some input. It was quick, so you know, it wasn't something that I, I think if we had more time, we could have develop, developed it further. But that's why I'm giving you the update here in case we want to make any changes. We also... Um, we added some language within the science questions that we thought was appropriate for um, regarding microphysics. And then we also wanted to focus on the priorities and approaches. So what are the time scales that we care about? What are the human components of this? And um, what is NCAR specifically uniquely positioned to address? So that was kind of that was the topic of that workshop. And we put together, um, there's a QR code to our, um, what, what we, the summary we submitted to Yaga. You can find that here. And from a, our breakout discussions, we identified three main scientific grand challenges that we thought um, were uh, addressing the priorities of SPAT. So thinking about that human component, what are the big impact areas, and where can we also leverage these systems to learn more about cloud microphysics. And those scientific grand challenges were wildfire couple systems. So thinking about everything from drought to precipitation to pyrocumulus to like long, longer range transport and you know impacts potentially for cloud seeding there. We talked about the hydrological cycle and we also talked about, of course, extreme weather events, including things like hail. And so when we put together what are the approaches that we could come up with, to think about uh, addressing these science questions, we came up with um, these five listed here. So one is um, integrating our model representations of cloud microphysics through model hierarchies. So this is something we just heard all these introductions, people working on models of various scales. So how can we bridge between those and think about working together? Um, everything from CC's direct numerical simulation to the global climate model that's used for decision making and policymakers. The second one we thought about was enhancing observational capabilities. So Sarah is very familiar with our cloud probe limitations and um, things that are kind of low-hanging fruit from that point of view, but require quite a lot of investment and development, I would say. Um, and then the component of thinking about machine learning um, and artificial intelligence. And then, of course, bringing bridging between mo models and observations was another aspect, which um, we're, we have projects now kind of thinking about that. So, and then also convergence research. So that's thinking about the societal impacts. So this is kind of what came out of that meeting to remind people who were there and inform people who maybe weren't. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions re regarding this or comments or reactions? Um, feel free. 
So what we did is we submitted this to Yaga and in a quick, very quick uh, turnaround, Yaga was able to incorporate quite a bit of our feedback. So if you've been involved with some of the NCAR strategic planning um, efforts, there has been more language related to these topics. Um, and so thank you, Yaga, <laughs> for being able to incorporate these, these aspects. But we have been invited to think about kind of a follow-up discussion um, where we want to think about where would we start, basically. So how would this group and this community think about prioritizing these advancements and challenges? Where would we start? And things that Yaga wants us to specifically think about is what can we complete within the next couple years? And are these things, uh, are these um, approaches and efforts feasible currently with the current staff and tools that we have? perhaps some small investment um, is possible. So that's kind of our open discussion right now um, is, you know, what are people's experiences and in, in things like using model hierarchies? What would be required to stand something like that up over the next two years? Um, where, where are we in the observational capabilities? What's needed down, like what are we anticipating as a need from the EOL point of view? So these are the types of things that we're looking um, to, to provide to Yaga as further guidance for what can be possible over the next couple years. And I'm going to pause here and see if Yaga, if I've misrepresented anything. Um, <laughs> but um, Yaga is also here. I, I'm hoping to help direct us and um, guide the discussion to make it useful for her and, and her team. So. Yeah, you mentioned about uh, the existing staff in the NCAR are additional funds to the existing staff to do that. Will it happen in next strategic planning or like coming fiscal year, anything to be done that way, additional resources to anyone interested to work on this? Okay, so the question was, are there any funds that will be available for investing in stuff like this? Yeah, when? When and when, how much? When and how much? I think that's the million dollar question. <laughs> do you want to comment on that, Yaga? Okay. Yeah, I think all of that is not exactly clear, but I think because it needs to depend on what would be proposed to do, right, and how that fits into the priority. So that's partly why I asked Christina this specific question. So if we had to start, what would you do? Because then you would could think back whether you have the staff or whether an investment is needed, but sometimes you may put things on the table that we don't have staff that could do it, right? So then it's a... Um, not a great solution. Yeah. So that's why I was asking the things like, if we did have resources, because it is still a little bit questionable, um, what would that look like? Yeah. And I, if we have the tools, right? So if you need a model configuration that doesn't exist, would that need to be developed yeah. first, right? If you're proposing a $5 million instrument, that likely won't get funded in the September. I guarantee you it won't. But yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, that's partly knowing what would be on this list a priority and where could you start. Yeah. So for example, yeah, the model hierarchy is a great one, right? Yeah. Like if we were going to think of the long-term vision that we use the output from these LES type models into validating a global model, what are the steps that could be taken sooner than later, or how would that pathway look like over the next five years of the path of the strat plan? Yeah. And I think one way to look at it too is that what can we do right now? It's kind of almost, I hate to use this word, but I don't know what else word, what other word to use, but kind of grassroots where it's like we've already got some momentum in that area. Like you already have people working on some algorithm for remote sensing measurement that people in the LES community aren't aware of. And so like bridging that into a way that allows for some useful model development, right? Like that's a, there's some momentum already there that with just a little bit of extra funding and focus, you could, you could produce something valuable that moves forward that after two years, maybe there's more funding, right? I think that's where I'm laying is let's, as a community, demonstrate that we can figure out how to work together across labs, work together across observations and different model scales, and then we'll be able to get more funding. I'm, I'm almost like, we have to. We're going to high resolution modeling. Like, how are you going to ignore microphysics? So I think it's a great opportunity for this community. So if anyone have comments online, you can join Slido and 
And, you know, we have some people here from the university community, and that, that's useful feedback for us to have in terms of, you know, what are you guys seeing as possible areas for us to step in and, and provide additional community resources and things, right? So even if you're not at NCAR, we still value your thoughts on where we are. So, okay, thanks. Yeah, so I have comments. Okay, so I have comments on, on a few of these proposed advancements. And so the first is a number two, enhanced of observational capabilities and networks. I think you know any amount of funding, you all can come up with something we can do with it. <laughs> so I think it, it's really about um, identifying the, the biggest needs. Um, and I was, but more in general, I was wondering how, how these fit into into the general anchor strategic plan planning. For example, if I look at number four, bridging the gap between cloud observations and models, I mean, there are these big initiatives that are proposed, like INFORM, for example, or the, the APAR um, observ observation simulator. And the, there are things that are already ongoing. And so I'm, yeah, I'm wondering how these pieces fit together. Does, I mean, I can keep responding, but also if somebody has something to say, please interrupt me. Um, I think you're right. So since this workshop, INFORM was funded. So that was before this. So these recommendations were made, and then INFORM got the green light. Is Christine, that pretty sure the order of events? Can you inform? Oh, I will inform? inform you all on the Inform project. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, Inform is integrating field observations of, with research models, I think is the acronym. Um, but Inform it includes three work packages, one led by CGD, one led by m -cubed, and one led by EOL. Each of these projects are intending to think about bridging observations and modeling. For the Compass project, which is what I'm leading, it's all about bringing more aircraft campaign data into our model diagnostics practices for the community or system model. We can talk about all the reasons why that's really hard <laughs> offline, but um, so that's the Compass one. And then there's another one out of MCube called IMOP that's going to be thinking about applications of APAR data. So that's the airborne phased array radar um, applying forward operators and data simulation. And then the EOL led one is basically supporting the observation analysis and needs for those, those projects. So, um, but that, that just got the green light as uh, next two years of funding. So that's what that is. But so yeah, you're right that Inform sort of addresses that, but there may be other ways. So for example, things like model hierarchies would be very helpful for bridging an aircraft data set to a global climate model. <laughs> um, and so some of these are kind of complementary where advances in number one may help advances in number four, right? Um, so I think there are a lot of places where investments in one of these will benefit other pieces, but yeah. Yeah, and I'll just add a little bit to that. So the things that we're looking for as a center is things that really make NCAR unique, that really can't be done in a just a university. So for example, like the model hierarchy using the expertise on a smaller scale to feed back into the global models is one of those areas, right? And it includes a large, vast amount of people bringing people together around the center. So those are the things that NCAR wants to rally around the big things, right? So yes, you could add a little bit of money to one aspect, maybe, and it's small, but we're looking for how do you get the big things done the universities alone can't do, but you can do this maybe with universities, mm -hmm. right? But making that plan in five years, if we want some results from CM1, for example, to be informing the global model, how do we get carve the pathway to yeah. get there? Yeah. Was that helpful for your question? Okay. We have one question on Slido. So Maria asks, we have staff that can work on coupling radiation and war fire smoke emissions to the atmosphere radiation, but we need funding. Yeah, so I think thinking about whether or not that's, you know, the, pri the main priority. So I guess that's an open question for this group is, you know, how uh, one question is, you know, you can talk, think about model hierarchies, but that could be applied to many different systems and quest science questions, right? So do we stand up a model hierarchy that specifically addresses wildfires? Like maybe that's a long-term plan, but harder to do early on, but with some initial investment, you can 
you know, have a better high resolution model or something like that. So that's another place for comments is, you know, where, where to kind of focus these efforts in terms of the scientific questions, where, where should we focus, right? Like, is it ice phase? Is it warm phase? Is it aerosol? Is it, you know, what piece of this is of highest priority to this group? Okay, well, we will have more time to discuss, and maybe after some science talks, we'll have more ideas. Um, I think one of the things that um, I'm, I'm excited about in terms of this workshop and the next workshop is just having people present their science so that we can all learn a little bit more about what, what's going on at NCAR. Um, I want to really quick have Pooja introduce herself because she wasn't here. Um, <laughs> sorry, you missed introductions, but really quick, we can grab that. Any other final comments before we move into the presentations? Yeah, Vivek, I'll come back to you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Pooja Roy. Uh, so I joined as an ASP postdoc at RAL um, six, seven months ago almost now uh, in January. I work, I work with CC, uh, Lulin, Sarah, and I also collaborate with Hugh, Kamal, and Votek uh, at MQ as well. So my work uh, is mostly on, as I will present my science talk later today, uh, you'll get to see what I have done for my PhD at University of Illinois, and also what I'm planning to do um, at, uh, with DNS simulations uh, with CC and others over here. Yeah. OK. Thanks, Pooja, and welcome. OK, and then I think we have one more comment from Vivek. Yeah, with the inform, uh, we mentioned about it. I mean, UIL got some funding for the inform. Uh, we're thinking about some of the parameterization schemes, forward modeling, all the things, things like that. But in addition to it, I mean, UIL has a very good observation, C set in Socrates. We produce a lot of products, which is a cloud depth, microphysical parameters. But to make use of that, we need someone to work on that to you know, look at it more carefully, tune it, whether it I'll email you. Sense, all the things like that. <laughs> that requires a lot more effort. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah. It, maybe it needs about, I mean, um, half an FTE or yeah. small percentage of someone to produce more products and see whether it really applies to parameterization schemes. This yeah. all could be done because those those uh, opportunities are very calibrated. Yeah. You know, it's nicely done for uh, many scientists looked at it, mm -hmm. reviewed, peer reviewed papers are published on that. And there's yeah. a small step, like uh, number four, the bridge yeah. the gap between cloud observations and models yeah. that could be done with the UIL as lot of these observations. No, that's models. great. Yeah. And I, I will reach out, actually, because Socrates and CSET are my primary field campaigns I've been talking about. But for in-situ measurements, but remote sensing is the other piece that is yeah, extremely I mean, valuable. Yeah, bridging the gap between in-situ is uh, remote yeah. measurement. That's yeah. a big, big yeah. challenge because there are people who are kind of in-situ, cloud models, and you know yeah. the remote measurement. There are three different things here. Yeah. But yeah, I think this is an example where we do have a lot of staff here that with a focused direction can get quite a lot done. Is that part of the focus? Yeah, it is. We are focused mainly on the uh, in-situ measurements right now, but it doesn't mean that we're only going to do that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. OK, so for the speakers, I have a cute, adorable <laughs> timer <laughs> that I'm going to basically subtract three minutes from your time. And that way, when it gets close, I'm just going to raise it up, which means you have about two to three minutes. But we're not going to, like, it's pretty informal, right? So um, <laughs> so don't stress too much, but just so that we, everyone has an idea of the time. So if you see me raise this up, that's your about two to three minute warning. OK? All right. Is that a two to three minute warning before the question period? Or Before the end of your end of time, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Does that sound okay? Do you want me to do something different? Okay. Cool. Okay, and I'm going to pass this over to CC. Yeah. I guess the next speaker is Wojtek, and. He will talk about the cloud of his spectral broadening. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sissy. So I changed the title a little bit because I gave a seminar with the same title as I put on the agenda. So I thought it's 
kind of. And also, if, if you've been to the ICCP in Korea the last month, you've seen some of it, but not all of it, because I, uh, that's something that, that I keep working. Uh, so I'm moving forward, but I don't, I still have a lot of questions, but you, you will see where I'm going. So, uh, so the, the main team, uh, historically, look at the date. We're talking about the paper published in 85, but there were earlier papers also, really showing that droplet spectra observed, observed in this kind of almost undiluted volume of clouds. So this is for cumuli. This is like this picture shows, you know, small cumulus. Um, actually, they were probably larger than small because it was in Montana, a big project in, in the mid-'80s. Uh, or early 80s, actually, before I came to NCAR. Uh, the idea here is that if you look at this spectra, um, I'm not sure I can probably show it with my pointer uh, here, although this is not a very good pointer. I probably should learn how to change it um, to something bigger. Do you see it? Probably you don't see it. It should be like something that will show the... There we go. Oh, I know this is this this talks to the computer. Okay, it's beyond my pay grade anyway. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, 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 okay. That's too much. Um, so I will use this one, but sometimes you can get like a pointer, not the small arrow, because this arrow is the same. Anyway, so the point here is that if you look at the observations and this is calculated. And those are uh, kind of spectral widths here, so 1.3 micron, 1.3 micron. But if you take adiabatic parcel and activate, you get adiabatic spectrum, which, is, which has a width of, of one-tenth of a micron. So there, there is a problem, of course. We don't understand why it's so. So that was cumulus. Then with my colleague from Poland, we wrote a paper on kind of different observations, better instruments, higher spatial resolution in stratocumulus. And again, the spectral width is one, maybe two microns, but it's definitely not as, as narrow as the adiabatic parcel would suggest. And those are just different. One is more polluted than the other, but still, and increases, decreases with height doesn't matter, but it just, it's just, let's say, close to one micron. So of course, there is a, there is a question that when, when I kind of get into this, when I came to NCAR in uh, late 80s, the question was, can small turbulence explain the width? Uh, of droplet spectra and undiluted cloudy volume. So uh, with my colleague, Peter Yao, some of you may know him. Sissi, of course, know Peter very well. Um, you know, and Paul Vollengurt, uh, that was his PhD thesis. We basically thought, okay, so how we can address this question? Can we do like DNS? That's what people often do. So it's a periodic box. Uh, we're talking long time ago, actually those papers were published a few years after uh, Paul did his, his work. Uh, so the volume was kind of a, almost like that, one liter. Uh, that's how the computers uh, were those days. And, and this is just the example. So you start with basically um, the volume, uh, you get droplets of the same size, so that's why spectral width is zero when you start. And then you run it, as you can see, you don't run it very long, 10 seconds. Uh, so it's kind of uh, small, uh, very short time. And you can see that the, there is the, then some spectral width gradually uh, develops and increases. And I will not go into details, but depending what you do in the model, of course, model is nice because you, you can do whatever you want with the model. You can see that some of those assumptions, for example, no sedimentation, no droplet inertia, have some impact how quickly droplets grow. Uh, but the, the main conclusion was that it's really this, this width is very small, okay? Now, of course, turbulence, people got interested in this problem. Uh, and then there is a bunch of papers that kind of follow, uh, looking at various aspects, trying to do bigger domains, um, and, and so, so on and so forth. But I will not talk about those papers. But uh, there is even a theory which uh, uh, some of the physicists that look into this problem advance, uh, which was basically idea that if you do those calculations, the spectral width, uh, radius squared spectral width, and there is a reason why we sometimes talking about radius squared spectral width, that it should increase with time. So that's why they have here in the title of this paper, continuous growth of droplet size variance. Okay, 
Now, um, then the question is, as pointed out fairly recently uh, by some of the uh, people that work with Raymond Shaw in Pike Chamber uh, in Michigan Tech, that uh, if you get this periodic box, you're really keeping your droplets inside this box, and with us in reality, if this is uh, infinite box, they will kind of move out. So T1, T2, T3 is kind of like droplets that you would follow as a function of time, but of course in the periodic box, this droplet will come back. So, uh, of course, when droplets move out, move up, then they grow and they move down, they evaporate, and then, and then of course, when you bring them back, they can kind of circulate up um, and then they circulate down. So that's, of course, a problem. And can you show that this is a problem? And, and I've basically done it in a very, very sim system, very simple system that mimics the impact of turbulence. I hate whatever I do, it kind of shifts. I, you know, maybe I should use this one, but anyway. Um, so uh, this is the approach that was developed by some turbulence people that basically model uh, supersaturation fluctuations because, of course, this is the, the key. We're looking at the supersaturation fluctuations through uh, the, the approach that represents the fluctuations of the vertical velocity. You march forward in time with it uh, through the stochastic um, differential equation, so you get some kind of a memory term, if you like, and then new perturbations that coming from knowing what is your turbulent kinetic energy and so on and so forth. And of course, these velocity fluctuations drive supersaturation fluctuations through this kind of well-known, uh, going back decades, uh, equation that is driven by vertical velocity, and this is phase relaxation that dumps supersaturation fluctuations. And of course, droplets respond to those supersaturation fluctuations. Um, uh, but but and we've done it too with my colleague from Warsaw some, some time ago, uh, but we really didn't keep track of what, what, is, what are the height changes. And of course, that's the key in this argument about uh, particles kind of going around, if you like. So now if you keep uh, the, the height, so that's the bottom, the, the height changes, this is what we actually see in as a function of time. So we're looking at this is radius squared, and we're using simple growth equation, as you can see here. Uh, just the radius squared is proportional to the evolution of the radius squared, depends on the supersaturation fluctuations. That's, oh, sorry about that. That's what you, what you like to look at, the radius squared, and here's its height. So you can see larger droplets move higher up, smaller droplets move, move down. And then, of course, if you look at after some time, then, of course, droplets keep moving away. Uh, and then if you look right here, this is where really what we are after. This is this, this spread, very small spread, if you take out away this, this spreading. So if you would look at all droplets here, of course, you get this, this half uh, square root of time scaling. But if you just look, look near the origin, then then, then it actually stabilizes. So this argument about continuous growth is really not, not correct. So you may ask, so where this square root of time scaling comes from? And of course, this is, has been known for over 100 years from Einstein, Smolokowski. Uh, it's like a random walk. And in fact, you can show that if you look at the standard deviation of droplet positions uh, as, as here, then of course it grows in time. And, and it's, that's where this square root of time is uh, coming from. So, um, and in fact, you can, you can look right here near the origin and kind of ex subtract this growth because of height, and then you can, you can uh, derive, depending on the scale of the box, I didn't mention that, but the bigger the box, the bigger the effect, you expect at least, and this is radius squared and radius standard deviation, uh, as a function of, of, this, of this size of the box, if you like. And the, 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 the increases with the size of the box and stabilizes because of this quasi-equilibrium supersaturation. So if you look at this equation, if you, if you assume that this is zero, then the supersaturation fluctuation is just the function of the vertical velocity. It's proportional to vertical velocity. But displacement is also proportional to the vertical velocity. So if you assume that there is quasi-equilibrium, then of course, this should saturate because the, those fluctuations will, will be, uh, supersaturation fluctuations will be basically just depending on, the, on the how far you go. 
So anyway, so this is what, what is in the paper that is in the review. Now, the question is where we go from here. So uh, apparently that, that approach that we use, DNS, didn't work. So what we can do, well, uh, we are lucky that we have big computers now and we can run really high resolution simulations of maybe, maybe 10 meters, maybe even higher. And this is one of the examples uh, that was done fairly recently by Kamal uh, with Hughes' help. Uh, really high resolution, so this is three-dimensional, driven in a very realistic way, and that's quite important. I will, I will explain this in a moment. Uh, and it's just seven and a half meters. So we're looking at a cloud that is uh, several kilometers across and, and, and three or four kilometers tall with really high resolutions. And we're using this Lagrangian approach, um, Lagrangian particle-based approach. So in other words, we're not using any traditional microphysics parameterization. We're using what we call super droplets. And it goes back to maybe 10, 15 years when our colleague, uh, Japanese colleague, proposed this approach. And we really like this approach because we can do much more physics with it than, than it was possible possible before. So uh, this is just a visualization of this cloud. Uh, and except for rain, that looks still a little bit unrealistic. We talk with you about that. You can say that this small scale turbulence is, is really kind of a high resolution, really makes it kind of looking realistic. So uh, now some examples. So this is mean radius as a function of height. So you can see that it, of course, increases as we expect. But there is a lot of variability. But I'm really looking at, like to look at this small volume here near the cloud base because this is where you can safely assume that the cloud is adiabatic. Um, because there is really no entrainment. Of course, here everything happens because of entrainment. OK, so if I do that, <laughs> oh, you see, this is <laughs> one of the important pictures has not. Oh, no. This is. Do you mean to download it? Uh, well, I don't know what to do, but the, one of the key pictures is actually so not, not being shown. But anyway, so if you look at this volume, and this is uh, kind of enlarged here, this is updraft speed. And because it's really a turbulent volume, you can see that this velocity, depending on where you are, this is 3D volume, really changes from close to zero to, to maybe a few meters. The mean increases with height because the updraft accelerates above the cloud base. We kind of expect that. But, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, this is this is key picture, uh, but I can tell you what it shows. It's basically because the flow is turbulent here. You can calculate. Well, of course, model calculates subridge scale turbulent kinetic energy, and the line would be somewhere here. It's not there. But then you can actually calculate what is what is really turbulence that model predicts. So in other words, at any level. At every level here within this box, you calculate the mean uh, velocity, and you calculate the perturbations, and then you calculate turbulent kinetic energy, which is here. So, in, which would be somewhere here, and this this value is about 10 in in meter squared per second squared. So the uh, RMS velocity is kind of like somewhere between one or, or two meters. So um, this volume, although it's coming from the cloud, but it is, it is really turbulent. And, and now, now I have to explain how this cloud is really forced, because that's, in my mind, the key uh, of how, how we actually simulate this cloud. So this cloud is simulated in the following way. For about an hour, you drive the boundary layer through homogeneous surface fluxes. And basically what you do, you spin up turbulence within the boundary layer. And after about an hour, you replace this homogeneous flux with the flux that has a maximum in the middle. So that forces the, the not the kind of a random updraft as in the boundary layer dynamics, but it forces fairly ho homogeneous ascent. But of course, this ascent is turbulent. So even before, below the cloud base, there is already a, a turbulence, which is actually quite significant. Uh, and I think that is the way you can, uh, you can understand what's going on during activation and after activation. So um, this picture on the left is actually uh, the result from model simulations. This is kind of a one way to look at the, what happens near the cloud base, that you take a parcel and you kind of rise it with, depending of 
the different velocities, five meter a second, two and a half, one, and it actually increases with height. So this is just at the height here, but then, uh, then I'm adding two meters a second. So it really accelerates, but I don't think that's that important. Uh, but the important point is that the, uh, the, the spectral weights really decreases with height, as we kind of expect based on, on the physics. Um, and I'm marking here that the scale on the right is different than the scale on the left. And this comes from the model. So now what I'm showing here is the end of the line. Lines are, uh, I think, 95th, uh, fifth and 95th percentile. And this is uh, between uh, one quarter and three quarters. And this is just the mean. The point in this figure is that, that indeed, if you compare this, to this, which is actually this, this diagram, uh, really uh, the, there is a significant difference. So in other words, the presence of turbulence uh, with some caveats uh, makes the spectral widths, first of all, uh, at the cloud base, it's kind of comparable if you think about it, because this is where activation happens. So there is, there is basically no activated droplets here. Then you activate. Uh, and yet the cloud base is kind of comparable. So the activation is probably done. You don't need perhaps turbulence for that. But then, you, as you can see, it decreases for the adiabatic parcel, but it kind of increases, but also the, the spread also increases. So, uh, you know, this is maybe not as large as you would uh, if you go back to, uh, to those pictures that I started with those papers. But, but there is something there. And of course, now, uh, now the next step is to kind of understand where this is coming from. And I'm running some simulations that you have not only adiabatic ascent, but you also have different elements, for example, the turbulence coming from, from here. Perhaps one important caveat is if you look at, at some of those previous uh, results, uh, uh, sorry, right here, here is the scale. So I have to define the scale uh, in my uh, kind of simple statistical framework, if you like. But of course, in those simulations here, I don't have to do it because I know, I know what is the turbulent kinetic energy. Of course, you don't see it because the picture is not loaded correctly. That's probably uh, quite an important point here that um, there is really not much that I have to take from this simulation and, and do the parcel that is actually carry, uh, carried, uh, carrying turbulence. So, um, so that's where I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much done because, uh, of course, I want to understand it. And that's kind of the next step. So in summary, we've been using those uh, DNS. We also de developed this approach that we call scale-up DNS, that you make the domain larger, but also make the Kolmogorov scale larger, because we thought that the large scales are important. but uh, we've been using it uh, for 20 years, and there is also this theoretical analysis that suggests that droplet area radius squared standard deviation should continuously increase with square root of time scaling. But of course, the, the key feature was that we forgot that turbulence also means that particles are spreading. Uh, and when you do, when you track droplet vertical positions, so the, the impact is actually very small. And this goes back to to very old paper that actually argued that this is how you need to think about this. So the kind of a circle is closed, if you like, as often in science, you go back to something that people invented long time ago, forgetting that, uh, that you actually look at those papers. And anyway, and I hope maybe in the future, maybe half your time or maybe next year, I can show you that really there is an understanding, uh, you know, what, what is the key difference between this adiabatic parcel and what turbulence brings. There are other aspects that I think might be important. For example, in the adiabatic parcel, at the starting level, you take all the aerosols and you make them in equilibrium with the environment. That's, of course, not the case for, uh, for, for, for here. So anyway, uh, still a lot of things to learn, but I, but I think we're making a good progress on that. So thank you. Thank you. Very great talk. It was very amazing visualization. Um, yeah, any questions, quick questions, before we move on to the next speaker? We will still have time at the end of the oh, entire there session. Is something. Oh, there's someone. Oh, great. OK. Oh, nice, young. 
Yeah. 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 Uh, I couldn't re read that oh, name, but the, yeah. Oh, so. Carry on. <laughs> Fitzgerald in the 70s uh, showed incredible narrow cloud job lit uh, size distribution just above cloud base. He used impaction of cloud drop on uh, suited slides. In contrast, the cloud drop probes have laser beam inhomogeneities, leading to measurements of artificially large drop width. Well, since I am a modeler, I'm not capable of answering that, but yes. And that's why, for example, the, 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 the paper that I showed from, from CCOP showed uh, you know, one uh, really looking at 100 meters averages. The paper with HANA was 10 meter averages, 10 hertz data. So you know, then the question is, if you even use particle by particle uh, fast FSSP, that'd probably be different. But I, I'm, I can look, look it up, Dave, Dave's Fitzgerald papers. But yeah, obviously. Thank you. Or people who is in institute field that they can comment as well. If not, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, great talk. Thank you. I'm curious if there's a usefulness for kind of like if you were to take, for example, the Socrates data set and then composite vertical profiles of cumulus congestus clouds, does that provide more, like how, how can these work together, I guess is my question. Well, the, the main problem with, with cloud observations is that you cut it at one level and then you come back, whatever, five minutes or three minutes later at different level. People try to kind of make those levels in a way that the, the air moves with the mean speed. I think Jean-Louis was trying to do that. But it's kind of tricky because that's one part, but the other part of the cloud lives kind of on a, on a different trajectory, if you like. So it's... So you, you really need sort of follow... Well, what time. would help if we get something that can fly like that through the cloud base rather than like that, because... What about like so, that? Well, <laughs> so, yeah, but you, you cannot do it with the aircraft, but maybe you can do it with a drone that you can put into a, into a cloud through the cloud base, if, you know, something like that. But maybe not one drone, but 10 drones kind of going like that. Uh, because you, if you, even if you go like that, so just one column, and in fact, I think I have a picture like that, which kind of, yeah, right here. Uh, those are kind of, so those are just randomly chosen from that simulation, different columns, if you like, and you get the spectral width, which kind of changes with height. So uh, believe me, I didn't look, this looks pretty, pretty wide, but it's just really pure chance. I didn't look for the widest I can show you. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's... But I, um, I guess I think it's a really good point for this group to think about is like uh, within the NCAR observational facilities, I don't know that we have the observational capabilities to address this as well, like sampling problem. Probably we don't, but he, oh, Hugh was not at ICCP. So, no, sorry, Hugh. Who was at ICCP? The people from, from Brookhaven were showing really incredible capabilities of radar looking at almost sub-meter, almost centimeter uh, variability in height. So, um, yeah, I, uh, Hugh maybe can come and maybe he's aware of this work. Then I, I, that was for me, it was kind of eye opener that you can use remote sensing at such an incredible vertical resolution. Yeah, and, I remember that they presented at um, <clears throat> AMS last year, too. Okay. Uh, or I guess this year in 2024. But yes, yeah, pa Pavlo Sad, Galeos, and company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that, But I also want to mention the importance of the scale of the observations coming here. So I think the holodeck is a really key thing here because. Um, you can just look at the picture right there. Look at that structure that you see at very small scales and extremely sharp boundaries in there. And of course, if you're in a 100 meter scale of measurements or even 50 meters or 30 meters, all that's just gonna get washed out. Yeah, and you'll well, get the yes. Much broader, obviously, then. Yeah, so um, holodeck, but it's off. still, it's kind of, you're looking Little, now min through. Yeah, minimal sampling. Volume so like that, so. That's the main issue, yeah. But it's definitely, that's a really 3D and, and I know the, the holodeck, but Germans are, are really looking at taking amazing observations with, with their system. I know uh, Eberhard, um, 
wooden shops. It's kind of involved in some of those projects. They have a, they put it on a kite, kind of, hel- they call it hello kite. It's kind of partly filled and then kind of goes up. Um, yeah, so I'm was showing that in, in Japan when I was in Japan. Did you go to Nagoya? You were in Nagoya, am I right? He was, no, it was, anyway. Yeah, so definitely holographic instrument. I mean, we used to do it at Enka. And then, I mean, the holodeck is on the C-130, but I think, I'm not sure whether there are people who are looking at analyzing that data. Maybe that's kind of, I know it's, I know that the people that you're talking about are actually from, from, Just a uh, quick comment. Yeah, so Holodeck is still flying. It flies on both aircraft. Um, there is Holodeck data from Spicule, which was looking at cumulus um, continental. Yeah. But um, Aaron Bansmer processes the data, and it all goes in the archive. But we do need more people looking at Holodeck data. So on if that, you're interested I mean, in looking, the, come talk to me. Yeah, there was, there was uh, somebody who was applying. Uh, who may know? Say it again. Yeah, but the, the person who applied with through ASP, am I right? And yes. and and we wanted somebody that decided to go to a different place. That also tells you how NCAR is kind of not no longer the best place to do science. That's my team, so sorry. I hope Yaga is not listening. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. we're, we're, we're working with her, talking with Luis about. Yeah, so that's yeah. I'm, yeah. So, yeah so. Yeah, we should definitely yeah, that's something. They would be, of course, we have seven and a half meters, so it's not a volume like that. But I mean, there is, there is no, you know, everything. I mean, there is, whatever you do always has limitations. But I think, really, this, this simulations, I know, okay, I, know yeah. I know, I know, I know. Fair. But these simulations I mean, that Kamal it. and Hyo, they kind of prepare everything. I think it's, diff- in my mind, and I've been doing cloud modeling for, I wouldn't say 50 years, but 40 years for sure. We are now doing cloud, capable of doing cloud simulations, really looking at turbulence. Uh, okay, before yeah. it was kind of, it was, we were thinking we're doing turbulence, well, not, but here we are at the cutting edge of doing really clouds that are turbulent. For not only this, what I showed, but rain formation and rain initiation, all those things. So. Yeah, so we anyway. can continue discussion at the end of the session. Sorry. We will still have about 15 minutes yeah, for all the questions that couldn't be answered. Um, so let's move to the next speaker. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Waitek, for the great talk and the good discussion. So next speaker will be Vivek um, Josiran. Hopefully I pronounced your name correct. Sorry, yeah. Uh, thanks for the opportunity of presenting uh, a, a brief description about measurements. Uh, my co-authors, uh, Prof. Alex Kostensky from MTU, Michigan Technical University, and uh, Huang from uh, is a casual visitor to UIL. Uh, <clears throat> basically, in a cloud microphysics, everything from the size, one of the aspects is size and spectrum width. Could we do that? Uh, the size, you mean like a cloud droplets are in the micron size, then you go to drizzle droplets about tens of micron up to 500 microns, then rain droplets. And could we do that from using remote measurements? If you could do that, then you got at least something solved. Then other thing is, once you know the size, in general, bigger the size, spectrum will be broader, droplet spectrum. That's all to it. And this has been shown many times. So thanks to uh, uh, the SCR HSRL teams, they collected excellent measurements to do this, some other things. I'm showing basically a, a measurement from a CSET, that's a static cumulus observations over the oceans. Okay, what is the size? I mean, in general, people look at in-situ probes, effective diameter, or median volume diameter, which are very good for in-situ probes. But remote observations, we can't detect any of those sizes. I mean, whatever we do it, we can only estimate size what remotely radar, LIDAR could see it. And plus, our resolution volumes are much larger compared to in-situ probe. In-situ probe, of course, quite smaller. 
remote sensing probes measure about 100 meter scale. And there are differences. Is it possible to bridge the gap between in situ and remote measurements? We have three figures in this one, and the top figure shows the two independent measurements, one is a radar, which is a D6 measurement, relay scattering, LIDAR, it's an optical scattering measurement, the D squared. Two independent measurements can take the ratio of them on the x-axis, what it shows in a dB scale, radar to LIDAR ratio. Then in the y-axis shows RLED, radar, LIDAR, estimated size. And this size basically is independent of where's the gamma DSD, or is a modified gamma, or exp doesn't matter what it is. I'm defining a size just based on two movements. That's all to it. And so this is no mathematical uh, constraints on what I'm describing here. Okay, if you do that, how that relates to the effective size, or MEDs, that shows the bottom two graphs. And this could be related if you assume some yeah, we, uh, mathematical concept, we can relate that, what we measure to that. It's possible. And the key is we are able to estimate a size using remote measurements. Now, once you know the size, then that's the equation here, like a radar, LIDAR measurements, the Z and the beta, then we got the constant, the size related to very simple relations, what I showed, that's all to it. Nothing, there's no mathematical constraint to it, as simple as that. Once you know the size, then if you know the DBC measurement, we can estimate the liquid water content. Very good, we have done this, showed, compared, published results, comparing with radiometers. Hence, we have independent measurements from remote measurements using a radar, LIDAR, with active measurements. Then a passive measurements, radiometer, we were able to compare them and show, yes, it does work. It's a JTEC paper 2020, we have co-authors on that. And the size measurement does work in the remote observations. Okay, this is an example from CSET. This is a five minutes of data from a CSET uh, field campaign. The top panel shows uh, basically the height, was the, was the time, it's about 42 kilometers in this case, because flying 140 meters per second, a Gulf Stream is flying into that. And so it's flying very close to the uh, surface, about 300 meters here on the bottom most uh, dark line. And it's very close to the ocean surface, looking up. So what we see is the clouds of various intensity, and also see the darker uh, red uh, 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 color here, shows the precipitation. Hence, we have clouds of various stages here, initial stages, mature stage, raining. Hence, we have a lot of clouds, various clouds. Below that, it's the LIDAR measurements, which is a green light, 532 nanometer. And it shows very nicely cloud base. What we were showing before like that, these are of the cloud base here. And so we have a two independent measurements. But our top one is a radar measurement. This is a W band at 94 gigahertz bottom LIDAR measurements. Then we have additional measurements, radial velocity, up and down track, we can show that. Tr spectrum width, the turbulence, what we take questions, some other things. We can indirectly quantify what it is. So we have, but in this talk, I'm not using any of those velocity measurements. I'm focusing just to backscatter measurement. That alone gives us enough of information what we're going to do it. Now comes the question. Um, we published a paper, Yeston Science, uh, Ulrika Ramshash here and myself, um, where you can distinguish various particle types in a cloud. Is that a ice phase, liquid phase, super cold, cloud droplets, all things could be done. And this is a standard product in UIL database, you look at the observations, we can provide those cloud microphysics, about six, uh, about 11 different categories. Now, the key is, we could distinguish between cloud and drizzle. It's possible. But could we do the cloud to drizzle onset? That's where a transition happens. And that is not that easy to do it. What we have done is we took that product, then added one more measurement called absorption measurement. With that, we could distinguish the transition between cloud to drizzle. That's the key, because a lot of people want to know, is it going to be 
drizzling soon or just a cloud? What is a, I mean, um, basically auto conversion process in cloud modeling? That's a similar thing here. Yes, we can do that. I'll show you an example here. Now, in the top, they have two panels here. Measurement came from the same data what I showed you. That five minutes data what I showed you earlier, the same measurement here. The top panel shows the standard product. What you published it is kind of verified. It hit its more than 70, 80% accurate. What you do that one, cloud thing. In the height, was a five minutes of data set. What we show here is a cloud drizzle under rain. The bottom panel shows one more addition to it, yellow color. It shows cloud and drizzle where the transition takes place. This is a key measurement because we want to know when the cloud became a drizzle. It's not after the drizzle. That is a huge research area and that was impetus. Hence, we can do that. This product, I'll show you, but is it verified? Logically, things does fit. If someone could verify this, good, but logically what they show, it work. Now, here is the thing. Using the remote measurement what I showed you earlier, we could estimate the particle size up to even 400 microns, what I showed here. The ratio on the, the, on the x-axis is a two reflective, basically from radar and LIDAR measurement. That's all to it, nothing more than that. There's back pattern measurements. One's a D6, a D squared ratio. Other one is uh, radar estimated size, which once you know the size, we have so much we can do in a remote measurement or any other work, what we can do it. Here is the example here. In the same mesh what I showed you here, once you know the size, I characterized in terms of cloud, it's a blue color, then yellow is a cloud and drizzle. See the, how the size shifts, smaller to larger like that. Then the, the middle panel shows cloud and drizzle, and the drizzle can show that how the things are. The bottom most the drizzle and the rain. And basically we can characterize a cloud system using remote measurements not only they are cloud or drizzle, or cloud to drizzle, we can estimate the size. It's possible. Now, how does that fit number concentrations? Here it is, it's the last slide. Because I showed in the beginning, we can estimate liquid water content using the radar, LIDAR measurements. Number of concentrations known on the size, they can estimate the cloud concentrations. The top panel shows the cloud, number concentration, the true N of T versus estimated. This is from the probe itself, probe measurements, what we have a cloud probe, that's how we're showing that. The bottom panel shows the true measured from same drizzle probe with observations like that. And so we can do that. This is not from the actual measurement, this is the simulated vocals data, what you're showing here. And so basically, we can estimate not only the droplet size and the concentration, could we, do, we can do that. In what, from where we start, we can start from microphysical observations, from the radar and LIDAR observations, where you can remotely, you can say, the cloud versus drizzle versus ice, we can do that. So this may basically last slide here. Uh, we could retrieve the statistics of microphysical, macrophysical measurements, remote measurements liquid water content, particle size, concentrations, all could be done. If someone wants to make use of this kind of observations, we have tons of measurements. The only thing is we have no time to run this and come up with all the statistics, so I can validate whether it's how good we are. And so all could be done. And so this is where the observations could bridge the gap to in situ under cloud model. For example, auto conversion is a big thing, but are we doing good in auto conversion process? I, when they come up with the cloud concentrations, cloud droplet size, how they convert into that? You no, know, those kind of things could be done. And so with that, my last slide is just basically two papers what I mentioned. Um, one, a JTEC paper where we published the results. The other one is uh, uh, Enrique and myself. We did this paper in uh, Yersen Space Science and AGU. And so these things are no, peer reviewed, and we have the results, but we are only observationists. We're not modeler, and we need to learn from other people what we can do better. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Hi. Uh, thank you, Vivek. Uh, any questions? Any online question? 
with uh-huh. you. Do you think those simulations that I showed, can you use uh, some of that data to kind of, I don't know, train your, your algorithm or improve your algorithm? I mean, of course, this is not real cloud. This is kind of virtual reality. But I think, I strongly believe that this is as close as we can get to, to yeah. that's, a, that's a convective cloud. That's just fantastic question, actually. Oh, over oh, the mic? OK, the fantastic question. If you have the bin microphysical schemes implemented in your model, shows various bin sizes. We have better than bins. Oh, OK. <laughs> then it's very good. OK, what, what you got? Size information, yes, of course we have it. Yeah. OK, tell me again, Avita. What you got better than bin microphysics, you said? Yes, because the Lagrangian particle-based microphysics is better than bin microphysics. You can do with it things that you cannot do with bin microphysics, like activation. <laughs> evaporation, but so it's, I would say it's a better in a sense that gives you more reliable information than bin scheme, basically. That's what I'm telling you. But yes, yes. the size and the, we actually had simulations with precipitation formation, as my picture showed. And we also have simulations with the impact of turbulence mm-hmm. and without the impact of turbulence. Okay. So for example, interesting question would be, can your algorithm, if you work with these two, can it detect which one is with turbulence, which one is without having impact of turbulence on droplet collisions, in other words, accelerating? And we, we have a paper on that. Uh, Kamal is the, the main person. So, I mean, this is great, but I think we, we have something that you can use yeah. Also, to, 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 I don't know, train, develop, yeah, I mean, improve. We, yeah, we don't have, in this case, we don't have to train. If I have access to the data what you provide, we could simulate equivalent radar, radar observations. From that, we can go back and see if I can retrieve what you got, the truth. Yeah, exactly. Could be done. So that we have a kind of circle where we started some truth, then simulate, and retrieve it, whether how, how close it is. We can yeah. do that. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's, it's, it's possible. It's not that difficult to do it. I would imagine that he'll have Yeah, I'm glad the Wojtek <laughs> mentioned that, but we have additional simulations too, not at the 7.5 meters, but we still have high res uh, super droplet simulations of stratocumulus and other uh-huh. cases like that, so. Fantastic. I mean, I have MATLAB codes which does all these things. Someone wants to run it, I can give it to them, or I could run it for some other specific time periods if I just want to do it. And so, I mean, I have some time to work on that, show some results. It's, it's highly possible. I'm interested in working with the modelers. I mean, you have a lot of information about all this, much more than what I show here. I have to show the very tip of the iceberg what we can do. But so much could be achieved with, with the, I mean, interacting with some of you here who are a lot of knowledge in this area for many, many years. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. Yeah, uh, since we have one minute, so I have a quick oh, question. Okay. Uh, so is your relationship, the RLED, um, is kind of universal, ap- applied to different types of clouds, or it's only uh, applicable? Yeah, it's to- universal. It, it's, it's, it's applies only to Cloud up to, I said about 400 microns. You don't apply to the raindrops and bigger sizes. Up to four, about 500 microns, we could do that. Because based on the D6, D squared kind of relation, that's all to it. And so yes, it's universal. It's not climatological. It's not geographical, anything like that. In fact, the JTEC paper, what we did, the vocals measurement was done in uh, Southwest Pacific, I guess, long time back. We took that measurement, developed the simulation models, apply to Northeast Pacific measurement, C set, it does work because based on physics, it's not based on any, you know, um, ad hoc, any uh, assumptions like that. And see, if physics is right, it should work. Yeah, it will work up okay. to find my contact. Yeah, I have more questions, but I can talk yeah, to you sure. later. Yeah. yeah, so our next speaker um, is Chuda Eidheimer from RHEL. She's going to talk about CAMP6 perturbed parameter ensemble. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry to NSF, I haven't, this is kind of from some older slides, so I haven't put the new logo on there, NSF is still there, so I was going to work on it, but <laughs> um, so I'm talking more about um, a climate model, the uh, uh, CAM model, so we're trying to understand the sensitivity of 
climate with perturbator ensembles, and I promise you there's a lot of microphysics work in with related to this. So um, just very basic, I think you all know this. Uh, so you know we can go from climate models down to really high resolution models, but if you look at climate models, we have large grid boxes, so we have to do a lot of parameterizations in there. In those grid boxes, we have to account for different types of land surface, like with ocean, and we have to account for mountains. Lots of different cloud systems that goes into the different mountains, uh, uh, the uh, different grid boxes. So you can see you can have a different convective system or a graphic system that are within one grid box. Um, you have to take account for a lot of different radiation impacts, um, turbulence, and all that. So we can't describe all this here physically. We have to put in parameterizations to account for this. And then if we now go into microphysics, you have just look at this cloud here. You have so many different types of species. You have so many different processes going to from cloud drops to raindrops, from uh, from cloud to ice, um, precipitation, and there are so many of these processes here we have to prioritize as well. And then you even go from, you, ha you have even different order of magnitudes that you can't even account for in especially these climate models and even regional scale models. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is like we, <laughs> all of this, much of this has to be parameterized and there's a lot of uncertainties in the parameterizations. What values are we using? What ranges are we using? So the motivations here is that we want to understand the climate, um, the sensitivity of climate to different parameter values. And so we created this pro parameter ensemble with the CAM6 model in the uh, CSM model. And we varied 45 different atmospheric um, parameters that influence cloud processes. And, um, and then if, if we want to, so we want to also um, vary these parameters so that every parameter kind of have a, when you change one parameter, you can also change other parameters because the, the combination of changing parameters can impact the, your results. The thing is that if you, would like to uh, vary 45 different parameters, and each parameter would only be changed two t one time. You have one, one initial parameter and then another, and then you want to have every single combination possible. That is like 10 to the 36 different possibilities. And we can't run the models that many times. And we actually ended up just running the models um, 263. We had 263 ensembles. And the way we are doing that, and also the, the, um, the parameters we are varying are impacting the cloud microphysics, aerosols, also the turbulence scheme, and also in the convective scheme. And we ran these with actually three different configurations. One is just the current climate, one with changing the sea surface temperature to represent um, a warming climate, and then one with pre-industrial aerosols. So we, can, uh, so we can look at different aerosol cloud feedbacks and forcing mechanism as well. But this is, what I'm showing here is just focusing on the, um, the current climate. Um, and this just here shows you all the different parameters uh, we changed. So the way we are managing to create this ensemble with only 263 ensembles is instead of 10 to the 36 um, number of ensembles is using the Latin hypercube sampling. So it's, we could just create a random sample where, for example, let's say we, we have two different parameters, A and B, and we want four ensembles. If we just do it randomly, we could end up with like B, you only have you basically these two samples here have the same value of B, which um, um, and then this here, these two ensembles here would have very close values of A. And with that one, you don't kind of get the entire parameter space. Our goal is to, to fill in the entire parameter space. But with the Latin hypercube sampling is that each, 
you, it's semi-random and you, you sample um, normally, but uh, what's been chosen before, what comes ne um, after the next um, value is dependent on what has been chosen before. So you can see here that B, all these uh, different parameter values are normally distributed, and then in A, they are all normally distributed. So you are kind of, you are filling out the parameter space, but you can see it's not completely uh, filled out, and that's where machine learning come in. And here is, oh yeah. <laughs> okay, I can't show you, it is, no. It's, it's fine. It's just showing that um, it's just showing three of our parameter values in a, in a spherical or in three-dimensional space, showing that when we chose our parameters, it's kind of normally distributed and it's kind of filling out the space. So it's just um, instead of two-dimensionally, it's showing three-dimensionally. Out of the 45 parameters we have, we actually have 45 dimensions. So is there any learning process in automatic? If someone is not set, it doesn't do much. You're still kind of playing with it, or you just say that is irrelevant. Uh, so there's nothing like that, am I right? Of the parameters, yeah. yeah. Not at this point. Yeah. So this is this is just okay. Let's just look at the parameters just and the parameters, right? yes, yeah, and I will show you uh, some of that. So, hope so. <laughs> yeah. So this this is so this is um, so. Um, so as you can see here, the two uh, axes down down here, those are two different parameters, and this um, you can see that we are not filling out the entire space. Um, this this uh, uh, z-axis is the uh, aerosol AOD, but we can use machine learning then to kind of just try to fill out the entire space. Um, so, okay, so. So here are just some results we have. Uh, if you liquid water path, long wave cloud forcing, very interesting, especially, especially in forcing, um, the, the radiation, radioactive um, balance, and also the uh, air, uh, just cloud top, liquid numbers. And this just shows you just the distribution of the values for all those 263 uh, ensembles. So you can see we have a big spread in. Um, in the, in the output when, as we are playing around with these parameters. Um, and the different colors are just the different types of simulations, one with the control, one with increased aer or lower aerosol, and one with increased sea surface temperature. Um, but then we can look at, uh, start looking at the parameters um, impact on different outputs. So um, we are looking at some of the radiation radiative uh, f um, forcings. Restum here, uh, so the three outputs. Restum, which is the residual um, model, energy balance at the top of the model. Uh, it's kind of something we want to be close to zero. And then short wave cloud forcing and long wave cloud forcing. And these are just showing two of the different parameters we are uh, um, changing, and it's auto conversion, which you already talked about, from cloud droplets to rain. And then uh, this is, the other one is fall, um, ice fall speed. And what we're just doing is that here we just increase the parameter value and everything is normalized and standardized. And here we are looking at the, um, the output value. So you can see, for example, that auto conversion is, and the steeper the curve, the more important the, the parameter is, or a more impact, impact the parameter have on that specific outcome. Out output. So you can see that auto conversion is, and these are all globally average values, is impacting the, um, the restum and short wave cloud forcing fairly much, but it's not, it's less impact on the long wave cloud forcing. While, for example, the, um, the uh, ice fall speed has a much more impact on the long wave cloud forcing already, yeah. And then we can take these, we can take these um, uh, slopes here and looking at all the different parameters and several different outputs. So now we are putting it into uh, this grid plot here. So on the x-axis is just all the different types of uh, parameters we changed, and they are um, grouped by turbulence scheme, microphysics scheme, aerosols, and convection. 
And here are a few different output we're looking at. And the ones over here, those are impacting the radiative forcings. So you can see here, and, and the darker the color is, the more it's the uh, parameter changed the output value. And the blue is, <coughs> is negative, so you increase the parameter value, output is going down, red is positive. So we can see here already that auto conversion is very important in radiative feedbacks. Um, fall speed, ice fall speed is also uh, an important parameter. It's also important for the uh, cloud liquid uh, path and uh, ice liquid path. Um, there are some parameters in the convective schemes that are highly important for the precipitation. So you can kind of get in some sort of idea of which parameter might be important. This is the, this is this is stonely averaged and globally. So you can have probably regional scale where you have different parameters might be a little bit more. Does it bother you that some of those parameters go kind of from dark red to dark blue? In other words. Is that kind of physically make sense that, that it's possible to go from positive to negative, from positive to negative? Like there are different outputs. This so okay. So so, so this one here. I mean, it's for example auto conversion. It's impacting blue. It's the um, radiative forcings here, but uh, long wave cloud forcing. Um, to, it's, to the slope yeah, yeah, changes. That's what you showed before. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's. Um, yeah, and I also want to comment here that it's a turbine scheme. When we pick the parameters, um, the people that picked the microphysics parameters had big ranges. The people that picked the convective uh, turbulence, they kind of, the range is not as big. So you have less, if we, if we would do it again, we would maybe have a bigger range. So you would have see more importance in some of these parameters. Or slope would be maybe a little bit different. And then we can also go, Looking at different regions, this is global. This is so then we take Arctic, middle latitude, tropics, and southern ocean. For example, the turbulence here is getting even less Im impacting the outputs in the Arctic. In the tropics, the turbulence is um, is becoming a little bit more Im impacting the parameters. It, so, it, so it's it's kind of you, you don't want to only look at the global. You want to kind of look at the regional scales too. Okay, and okay. So this is where some of um, let's say so some of the things you can do with this here is you can tune your model. You can change all these parameters there for just doing one and one. You can uh, tune your models. So here we are trying to uh, find which parameter values uh, you can choose um, uh, that will but that will kind of fit the uh, Vestom, short wave cloud forcing, long wave cloud forcing, and liquid water path. So what we're doing here is that we're taking all the um, per outputs. Um, let's see. So we, we, these are just the ensemble numbers. This is the PDF of all the different ensemble. And this is our, the machine learned. So we have 20 million samples. And the red here is the um, observations. And we want to find all the ensemble members that are within a certain range of the observation. And these ensemble numbers, ensemble member has to be within the range of here, 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 and here. So if we just use the ensemble members that are being modeled, we would maybe come up with one ensemble member that would fit that criteria. So that's why we're using machine learning to, to kind of get the statistics. And this here then showed a PDF of every single parameter. So these are all the sample members that fits the criteria of being within the range of all those four uh, outputs that we were looking at. Um, and then you can see in the red line here is the default values in the model simulations. Um, so one thing you can see, for example, the, this is the uh, ice fall speed. This one here is the, the nicest one, actually, because this one actually have a, <laughs> uh, have a maximum most of them falls within this value here. So maybe, maybe if the false bit value we should have in there should be in the middle of the range. Um, some of these parameters, you see that they are actually seems like we are way off. This is the default value. Perhaps this should be the values we should use. 
But one thing is that these, this range for this the turbulence was kind of small, so maybe um, maybe when we're not that off. And, and the other thing is that we only looked at four outputs. So it's still freely, highly freely variable. So to constrain it even more, we should look at even more outputs to constrain the values even more. But this is just a, a start. And um, so summary. Um, and the more and more are starting to use this type of bigger perturbed parameter ensemble now to look at uh, parameter sensitivities in, in the land surface model and the, uh, in different models. Um, so we can see there was a big spread in the results for the, all the different parameter values. Um, so we are using then emulators to probe more of the, uh, the uh, parameters, individual parameters uh, effect on the climate. Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so it's, um, this is also, also a tool that can be used to evalu evaluate model structures, because if you look at this and if you find parameters, non, not a single um, parameter value can replicate the climate, maybe there's also something wrong with a model. You can evaluate that and go in and try to figure out what in a model you can uh, fix and not only use it playing around with the parameters. So. Thank you, Chuda. So we, uh, we can have one quick question, if anyone. Thank you, Chuda. That's very interesting. So I was, uh, uh, I was just wondering, you showed like the model sensitivity to your different parameters, right? And you grouped those parameters into like four different uh, aspects, like microphysics, convection, aerosol, and there's other one, turbulence? I, yeah, I don't turbulence, know. Yeah. Yes, and, and I was just wondering, uh, I mean, microphysics is important, but it's just like kind of surprising to me that your results show so much uh, sensitivity to microphysics instead of then to the other three, like where you showed those like great plots or heat uh, maps, yeah, like that. Do you have any comment on that? And another, sorry, another quick question is like uh, in your microphysics parameters, did you consider any ice product ice processes? Like, I mean, uh, either primary ice production or secondary ice production, yeah. Well, first though, yeah, we didn't look at uh, ice nucleation, but we actually did look at uh, dust um, emission factors, which impact primary ice nucleation. Um, and we did look at some like fall speed, uh, and um, we looked at um, the um, auto conversion from uh, ice to snow. Um, so we, we did look at a few of those, yeah, the ice. and. Yeah, as I said, we was kind of surprised too, and that especially the turbulence did not seem to be so much impacted, but we think it's because of the range, that the, the values we looked at are so narrow that if we had expanded that, we would maybe see more variation in the, in the output values. Um, I mean, I very quick. I, 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 kind of, I don't know whether that's a comment or question, but. Uh, how many of those parameters go away if you go to convection permitting environment? I would imagine that, you know, auto conversion, yes, but it's both. I mean, I'm going from the, what I call a microphysics. Microphysics is a parameterization squared problem in, in climate model. It's a parameterized microphysics in parameterized clouds. So, I mean, I'm, this is perhaps a comment to Yaga. That, uh, that, you know, Europeans have this huge project that they're actually looking at, you know, they don't do climate simulations yet, but they really going in this direction quite rapidly. Uh, you know, they have this next gen big project that Bjorn Stevens and Sandrine Bonny, I mean, we are, I have a feeling that we are being kind of overtaken by you know, we used to be kind of leaders in some of those, you know, per simulations, but, you know, um, we lack, I don't know what we, what we are lacking, but we're lacking the, the emphasis on kind of moving, well, sorry, I'm, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. 
yeah. yeah, but I mean, you know, I know yeah. Bjorn, I, I visited Bjorn, and I was actually impressed what they're doing, not only in terms of science, but the environment that they work. You know, they insist on people coming to the office. Our management is very proud that we do not have to come to the office, which I think is a grave mistake. <laughs> we, we, yes, I do believe. And that's why actually I'm retiring, because I don't feel comfortable working in the environment that I don't like. I'm missing the discussions like that. Hugh is laughing because he knows how I feel. Uh, I miss before pandemic, you know, when you come <laughs> to the office. And, but, you know, many institutions coming back uh, to the office. You know, NOAA requires people to be three days or two days a week. We don't. And our management, I think, doesn't recognize that, that that's a big issue, that, you know, young scientists will grow in the environment that they don't know how to, you know, talk over the coffee or stop to the office. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think... I agree. Yeah, guy, if you can... I just Absolutely. Wanna... Really, really quick, I just Absolutely. want to say... We I mean, are... I'm going away from what we're talking about, but I'm <laughs> no, expressing it's fine. my frustration, basically. This is why we have this group here, too. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I think exactly. that's why we have the group. And I think some labs, so CGD, we're in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 80% or 90% of people are in. So I think it's up to you all in MCube to come in, right? It's, you have the permission to stay home, but... Well, it's everybody has a choice to come in, yeah. right? So people come in at ACOM, Simona is in, Rolando's in, a lot of the people I work with. So, um, yeah. It's yeah. Say it again. Round problem too. <laughs> yeah, it might. I'm not saying that it's not, but I think it's, and of course, this is like a decade long problem of separation as you did from us. I mean, yeah, so those are the things, like, we can't move buildings right now, but this is why we're having Christina lead this and try to start bringing people together and start having these conversations so we are coming together. And I think once people realize that they, hey, it's fun to come together and talk, people do start coming in, right? So it's partly you got to start somewhere. So thank you, Christina, for leading the effort. And true to NCC. <laughs> yes, NCC. And we are excited to see everyone that has have said that they can give a talk to this group here. So we want to have another... Next, yeah. next quarter, two more talks. So yeah, and really bringing like Zorn out or other projects may be partly what this group may want to do is right bring in the speakers who are what you think is at the frontier and just start inspiring. Because I think partly you need some inspiration too. Why are we doing this? Where are we going? Where are the lacks? So I think it's uh, partly you rebuilding so, so this. Coming to my question, how <laughs> many of those parameters will go away into your, in, when you go to the convection per heating simulation? I'm, I'm kind of thinking that about half of them would be would be gone. Yeah, after conversion yeah. would stay, but it would be kind of paused in a better in a better environment, if you like, kind of local liquid water content and things like that. Oh yeah, yeah. yes. But then I don't know. Would it be other parameters that would show up then? That we would. Yeah. Club, yeah. for example, or some kind of yeah. so. so it's a quarter yeah. of them, I guess, would go away. But you still need them in this type of modeling, because this is a one-degree model. So at this point, yeah, no, no, I understand even... that. But I'm, my, yeah, I'm basically expressing that. Yeah, okay, we have and Cube develop, you know, a global convection permitting model. But yes, it's one of the models that kind of submitted data to kind of beyond Stevens' paper when you have this whatever, 16 pictures, and one is the real world cloud, and the rest is from the model. But Bjorn's, Bjorn's model is not having, for example, all the capabilities that we have in some ways, right? What kind of aerosols do they have? What kind of stratosphere do they have? I mean, they don't, yeah. right? Sure. Yeah, I know, but... Start somewhere. Some, somewhere. Right, right, I know. But the point yeah. is that in this in this way, we what we want to do is going across scales, right? In, in some way, you need to develop something that works across. So in cloud permitting and in a parameterized world. And, and how do you do that in, in a framework like this, that we can actually bring together these two worlds? 
Yeah, but yeah. What, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm saying from M, from MQ perspective, well, maybe we should just go. Uh, for wait, 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 from, from your perspective, he's also he kind of runs with that, yeah. and also he has the privilege of telling everybody in his organization what to do. The culture here does not want to tolerate that, right? So we can talk outside, but there is many multiple reasons well, why we cannot. Well, do of course, MPI is things. kind of like one yeah. of our. Okay, we do need to we do need to move on because we have some speakers that are scheduled, so we're already behind behind schedule here. We can maybe just have a short one. Yeah, yeah. I'll just say one, one thing Trudy didn't mention here is that this methodology could apply, though, to all models. And actually, we're also using it for LES, which I think is a really nice tool. Um, and I just wanted to throw that out there with us. It's, it's a bit more general than just climbing out. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, you. Okay, I don't, again, the conversation is great. I don't, I'm not trying to say that we don't need to discuss these important topics. So we are going to take a five minute break, but we'll also have another about 20 minutes at the very end where we can talk more generally. So um, I'm just going to shift the schedule about 10 minutes, but we're going to take a five minute break for right now. So we'll be, we'll reconvene at 40. Is that what I, 42, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so we are officially 15 minutes over, but that's okay. We that's said the beginning, awesome. we were gonna be a little loose. Yes. Oh yeah, P please, go ahead. And then where did Andrew go? Did he leave? Okay. Andrew! <laughs> You can go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Masi uh, I'm a project scientist at Rao, uh, and what else? I, I, I work with Pedro, mostly uh, fire behavior modeling uh, and general numerical weather uh, modeling and uh, mesoscale and microscale turbulence. Uh. Awesome, thanks. Okay, as Andrew's returning to his seat, maybe he can introduce himself. Hi. Oh. We did introductions before you arrived, and so we were just uh, making sure everybody knew who everybody was. Oh. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, I'm Andrew DeZambo. Um, yeah, I'm a research scientist at the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research Operations, aka CRO, at the University of Oklahoma. Um, yeah, Sarah invited me to give a talk here yesterday. Um, a lot of us attended here, so, but for those that didn't, I like a lot of different things like climate energetics, serious clouds, clouds in general, but gravity waves, turbulence, yeah, a lot of different things, and Arctic clouds, of course, as well, too. So, um, love being here and hope to meet many of you if I haven't already. So, thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Okay, all right, I think everyone has been able to introduce themselves now. Thank you, Sarah. All right, and I'm gonna pass it over to Truda. Well, our first speaker out of four this, out of, uh, second session is uh, Pooja Roy, um, talking about ice nucleation and cloud droplets. Okay, um, so today I'm going to talk, talk to you guys about um, super cool evaporating cloud droplets and uh, potential implications of this um, evaporating drop, uh, drop, uh, cloud droplets uh, for ice nucleation at cloud edges. So majority of this is my PhD research um, done with my advisors, uh, Bob Robert and Larry D. Girolamo at University of Illinois. And also I'll talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming and the ongoing work that um, DNS model simulations based on looking at this particular mechanism with uh, the DNS model working with CC, Lulin, and Sarah at RAL. So let's uh, begin with some brief motivation and overview. Uh, as we all know, ice formation is uh, very important for uh, precipitation formation and also affects cloud microphysical and radiative properties in important ways. There has been two long-standing challenges in the cloud microphysics community, uh, especially with relates, uh, regards to ice nucleation. One of this is uh, observations of enhanced ice formation in evaporating regions of the cloud. Here is an example of the evaporation glaciation signature observed in wave clouds by Baker Lawson 2005. And here in this figure, you can see that there is an increase in ice formation um, near the edges of the cloud where uh, there is a lot of, uh, as we know, that due to relative humidity gradients, the droplets are mostly evaporating. 
The second problem is the discrepancy between uh, the number of concentrations of ice crystals and activated or predicted ice nucleating particle uh, concentrations in moderately supercooled clouds. And here in this schematic from Kanji et al. 2017, you can see that especially for this uh, moderately supercooled temperatures between say 0 to minus 10 Celsius, there is a huge discrepancy between the predicted uh, INPs and the observed ice crystal number concentrations. So essentially there is a multiple orders of magnitude uh, uh, observed ice crystals are much higher than that was uh, predicted for the INPs. So with these two problem long-standing challenges in mind, uh, we can have a hypothesis that it, does the evaporating cloud droplet play an important role or could those droplets play an important role to solve these two challenges? Let's um, delve a look, um, look into that a bit more. So there has been some previous studies which speculated that evaporating droplets at cloud edges exist at a lower temperature than that of the ambient environment. And this would lead to activation of uh, more numbers of ice nucleating particles than expected at a given ambient temperature. This and this would potentially lead to enhanced ice formation. And from this schematic uh, here from Shastri 2005, you can see that um, especially for this but two particular modes of ice nucleation, that is, that is immersion freezing and contact nucleation, both inside out as well as uh, external, it's the droplet temperature. Essentially, the INP is uh, exposed to, especially for immersion freezing and the inside out uh, contact nucleation, the INP is immersed within the droplet, supercooled droplet, and it's the droplet temperature or the water temperature that's being experienced by the INP. And uh, so hence from here, we can understand that it's important to uh, look and also calculate more accurately the droplet temperature evolution and how the droplet temperatures would deviate from the ambient temperature under certain conditions. So before um, I start into the methodology of the study, let's look at some of the traditional assumptions that has been made in theory as well as in uh, numerical models. So with this very simple schematic over here of a cloud, in the interior of the cloud where there is a uh, we can, where it is saturated, uh, the droplet temperature can be uh, safely or reasonably assumed to be same as that of the ambient temperature, uh, or the difference between the droplet temperature and the ambient temperature is not that high. But at the cloud edges and at the cloud top, uh, where there are strong relative humidity gradients um, and the droplets are evaporating, uh, there is also the zones of uh, mixing and entrainment, uh, the droplets are exposed to the drier air um, outside and are evaporating, and hence these droplet temperatures are, uh, we need to look into the uh, solve for, for the vapor and the mass transfer uh, continuously in order to get the accurate droplet temperatures for these cases. Would you have about radiation? Yeah, so. You mm -hmm. didn't look into that, huh? Yes, I did look into that, and uh, for my, I'll, I'll show, well, I don't have results for the radiative cooling over here, but in my first paper, when we looked at radiative cooling, especially for like very, uh, we compared between the two uh, cooling, evaporative cooling and radiative cooling, um, evaporative cooling was much stronger. So yeah, I can uh, briefly talk about that also. Um, okay, so in most uh, cloud models, uh, in the traditional uh, growth equations, what we do is um, we eliminate the droplet temperature uh, in order to, like for simplicity, we um, the uh, saturation vapor density difference is basically a linear function of the droplet temperature difference and the ambient temperature difference. And this linear assumption uh, is only valid when the difference between the droplet temperature and the ambient temperature is negligible. So, and that is a good assumption for this interior of the cloud. But as we can see from the results I'm gonna show uh, later, this assumption breaks down, especially for evaporating droplets and if for very drier environments. So in order to know what is um, the temperature of the evaporating cloud droplet, we need to basically solve for uh, continuous mass and heat transfer between the droplet and its uh, ambient and the uh, near environment. And here you can see, this is a radar image from, uh, I think one of Bob's papers over here. Uh, this is a schematic, basically there is a balance between the evaporation flux and the conductive warming from the uh, ambient environment here. And in this study, I uh, don't exact, uh, I 
uh, basically simulate the droplet temperatures based on the balance of heat transfer between uh, the droplet and its environment, considering latent heating, cooling, and conduction. Um, radiation and convection are ignored here. Sorry, this equations came out a little funny because of the transition from Microsoft PowerPoint to like Google Slides. But um, yeah, so very briefly about the first methodology. Um, so I'm basically using two different methods here. Um, for the first one, it's um, basically simulating uh, this single droplet I'm, uh, embedded in this air domain where it has, and the outside air domain basically has prescribed uh, temperature and relative humidity with um, far away from the droplet, it's T infinity, which is the ambient temperature we'll uh, refer to as, and relative humidity, which is also constant. And in order to uh, find out the evolution of the droplet temperature and radius, we need to solve for the time-dependent decay and the net heating rate of the droplet. So here are some of the results. Um, so looking at how, so essentially, this particular, if you look at the first plot on the left, so the droplet for a particular case of ambient temperature of 268 uh, kelvins, and I, the uh, simulation start with the same ambient temperature, the droplet temperature is basically the same, and the relative humidity for this particular case is 10%, which is pretty dry. So the droplet temperature essentially drops to um, around 263 Kelvin, which is a difference of about 5.1 Kelvins, and it reaches steady state. So for different, um, again, I apologize for the quality of, it, of the figure. I think because of the transition, it kind of lost the clarity. But um, what we can essentially see here is for three different initial droplet radius that I start with here, 10, 30, and 50 micron radius, or irrespective of the droplet radius, the droplet temperature essentially uh, goes to this steady state, uh, which we refer to as TSS here. Um, and this steady state temperature depends on the ambient relative humidity. So for very dry conditions, um, the temperature difference is much higher than as compared to, say, a relative humidity of 70%. So drier environment lower, uh, leads to lower droplet uh, steady state temperatures, uh, that is stronger evaporative cooling, um, as you can see from here. Next, we want to see what are the, identify the conditions, the environmental conditions, which would lead to stronger evaporative cooling for the droplets. And here, um, in this figure, I'm showing ambient temperature, a range of ambient temperatures from zero Celsius to minus 13, uh, minus 19 Celsius on the uh, y-axis, and a range of relative humidity um, in the x-axis. And the shaded color is essentially the decrease of the droplet temperature from the ambient, the initial ambient temperature, um, initial droplet temperature and the ambient temperature. And here you can see, as we expect, that drier conditions um, and actually uh, closer to um, uh, zero Celsius um, ambient temperatures leads to the strongest uh, evaporative cooling of the droplets. And since we are looking at evaporating droplets, uh, essentially the droplet radius is decreasing with time. So, and in order to uh, find out potential implications for ice nucleation, we need the droplet to survive for at least uh, some amount, a good amount of time in order to uh, kick off ice nucleation. So we should, uh, here we are also looking at the droplet survival times. So this is a, a schematic representation of how the droplet temperature is behaving as well as the droplet uh, radius in blue. Uh, over here, and the difference between uh, uh, the time of survival, which is basically TST, is defined as the total time the droplet exists at the lower steady state temperature before it evaporates um, completely. And these black contours are showing uh, that uh, the steady, uh, the time of survival for the droplets in seconds. So here, um, I'm plotting the same figure, but for in the top panel is for a different pressure of a lower pressure of 500 hectopascals. And in the lower panel, I have that for 850 hectopascals. And these three columns basically represent three different initial uh, droplet radius, 10 microns, 30, and 50 microns. And here we can see that um, the larger droplets with a larger initial radius survive for longer times in this particular cases. And for a higher pressure, the decrease in droplet temperatures are slightly uh, lower, as you can see from the color from this um, quadrant over here. So here we can, um, um, so the takeaway is that larger droplets are most, 
more likely candidates for enhanced ice nucleation by droplet evaporative cooling. And we have compared this um, time scale, survival time scales, with um, observations um, from like lab, lab studies for um, how much time does it take to like have a appreciable, appreciable amount of ice formation. And those were within this similar time, uh, like seconds of um, range. So this can be a plausible mechanism, which can also lead to this um, enhanced ice formation theory. So another thing that I looked at was, um, does this lower droplet temperatures um, change the evaporation rates of the droplets? Because the saturation vapor density is, again, a sensitive function of temperature. So um, here, what I'm showing over here is similar uh, x-axis, y-axis, looking at the uh, various uh, ambient temperature and the relative humidity ranges. But the color is flipped over here. So the color is basically the difference in droplet lifetime compared to a classical Maxwellian approach. Um, and here, for three, this three different um, relative humidity, uh, sorry, uh, the initial radius, we can see that for larger droplets with radius of 50 microns, uh, we get like a huge increase in um, difference in droplet lifetime. So in this humid condition, especially like at higher relative humidities, and especially for larger droplets, um, the slightly lower droplet temperatures due to the evaporative cooling can lead to reduction in the saturation vapor pressures at the droplet surface, leading to slow, slower evaporation rates and thus extending the droplet lifetimes. And it can increase by tens or hundreds of seconds. And this is also important for ice nucleation because it gives it more time to um, activate INPs based on like CNT. So, this was something um, that we looked at. And I'm not, I'm not showing the results for the radiative cooling over here, but uh, when we did a comparison between uh, both the, uh, the radiative cooling and the uh, evaporative cooling, essentially for most uh, drier conditions, evaporative cooling was much more dominant. But for uh, close to saturation conditions, um, radiative cooling uh, started to uh, play a more important role. Oh, sorry. Uh, OK, so just very briefly, um, so potential implications for ice nucleation. Um, as we know that most um, INP parameterization schemes underestimate the predicted conditions of uh, ice crystals. Um, and this is a uh, screenshot from Mayers et al. 1992. Here, basically, the droplet temperature, which is the TC, is essentially the cloud droplet temperature that needs to be um, used. So we need to be cautious, especially for looking at ice nucleation at cloud edges or, say, at generating cells at the cloud tops of orographic clouds, uh, et cetera. So this was um, just very briefly, I looked at Fletcher, Cooper, and DeMott uh, parameterization schemes and looking at uh, evaporative cooling uh, for those cases as this particular um, like quadrant of the ambient conditions, you can see that there is a huge increase in predicted INPs um, for this particular cases. Uh, the first results are published in uh, JAS last year. So here's the link to the paper. And if you want to uh, take a uh, closer look at it, I can send it to you as well. Um, now, for the met second method, essentially what we are doing is um, we are relaxing some of the assumptions that we had made previously, which is prescribed ambient conditions. Uh, in this case, we are um, basically uh, also evolving the ambient temperature and relative humidity in the near vicinity of the droplet. Um, so this uh, requires, um, since it is also a moving boundary problem because the droplet is, um, it is evaporating and shrinking in time. So we are using an advanced solver uh, called ComZone for this uh, problem, which employs uh, the finite element method to solve the coupled uh, partial differential equations of heat uh, and mass transfer uh, are with appropriate boundary conditions. Um, and here's the domain that I have used. Um, and Again, um, in the interest of time, I'm, I won't be uh, going into the details of that. So let's look at some of the results. So here we have the, for a particular initial condition of 273 kelvins all throughout the domain, um, I'm looking at the evolution of the droplet temperature um, as it shrinks in time, as you can see here. Um, so for this particular condition, with ambient relative humidity of 70%, uh, the decrease is about 5 kelvins um, when the droplet mass reduces by 99.5%, which is we define as the cutoff radius. Pusha, is it, is it, this is a three-day simulation, or just one day and you all know? 
the, and the only showing is kind of... It's a 2D. So uh, we do it on a 2D axis. domain, yeah. But the problem is really 1D. So why not 1D? With it 1D, you know, for the for to show the, the whatever we do. We can talk later. Okay. But, but okay. this is really a 1D problem. You don't really need to do it on a 2D axis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank remote, you assume that this is a prescribe, and I yeah. think that's what you assume. This is really a 1D problem. Well, let's, let's okay. talk. Yeah, we can, can talk more about that. Paper, well, okay. That. That's actually the second paper that I showed with Paul Monenko, which yeah. justify that there is a, this kind of a detailed fluxes uh -huh. of vapor and temperature with like a half a micron Good yeah, I have seen that work as well, like in Paul Well and Coates paper. So in the appendix, they have a comparison with, uh, yeah. Exactly. So I did the simulation, so I okay. it. Yeah. Oh, that's it. That's very interesting. So um, yeah, I would like to talk about that as well because uh, I think the differences, um, because over there it said that they did not need to resolve the spatio-temporal uh, like gradients in vapor density and temperature around the droplet because the results were pretty similar to what was. Uh, found without resolving the gradients, yeah. but we do find differences here. So, so yeah. we can talk about that. Yeah. Do you have, yeah, do you have a summary? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm just gonna skip to the summary over here. Um, uh, so essentially, uh, what we see. Um, okay. Uh, the big picture problem is to basically improve our understanding of droplet evaporation and primary ice nucleation in, in cloud tops and ages, and revisit the conventional assumption that the droplet temperature and the um, ambient temperature difference is negligible. Um, and for that, the method we uh, employ two different numerical frameworks, um, basically solving and um, quantifying the thermal and the radial evolution of the supercooled uh, evaporating droplets. Um, so the main outcomes is that the temperatures of evaporating cloud droplets are lower than that of the ambient temperature uh, far away from the droplet. And certain environments uh, which are characterized by low relative humidity, low pressure, and ambient temperatures close to zero Celsius lead to higher cooling of evaporating droplets. Um, and the first uh, and the second study where we also resolved the gradients of vapor density and temperature around the uh, near the droplet, it shows us that um, basically the, uh, we get these two boundaries. Um, or extremes where the temperature can decrease can be even as high as 20 kelvins uh, for very dry conditions. Uh, for higher relative humidities, even though the droplet evaporative cooling might not be significant, uh, but the evaporating droplet lifetimes can get extended by about 10 to hundreds of seconds. Um, lower droplet temperatures lead to higher number concentrations of activated INPs. So that is important for um, ice nucleation modeling. So the Impacts is uh, to basically to urge the community to use the appropriate uh, droplet temperature, especially while modeling, modeling the hydrometer evaporation as well as ice nucleation in subsaturated environments. Um, and this uh, might be one of the potential uh, explanations or uh, can help explain enhanced ice nucleation and evaporating cloud boundaries and at least partially resolve uh, the discrepancy between the number concentrations of INPs and ice crystals. So very briefly, uh, the future work or the ongoing work that I'm doing with um, CC and others over here is um, basically to study the impacts of evaporative cooling on evolution of drop size distributions at cloud edges. Um, and also we'll incorporate ice nucleation in moderately supercool mixed phase clouds um, in the DNS model. Um, and these are some questions for our team. Thank you. <laughs> And I think actually, since we are kind of late now for interest of time, I think we should just go to next okay. talk and then maybe we can have some question at the end or you can contact Pooja too. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're just starting to run a little bit late. Hi everyone, thanks for the opportunity to present some recent research. Um, again, like Wojtek, if you were at ICCP, you've already seen this, so hopefully you don't mind seeing it again. Um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk about some in situ observations from recent airborne campaigns. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the uh, input from my co-authors here um, from NOAA and NASA. So I know I don't need to dive too much into the motivation with this crowd of why we're interested in cirrus clouds. Um, so I will mainly use this nice 
figure from the recent Gasparini paper to highlight what I'm gonna be talking about in this talk. Um, so when we get deep tropical convection lofted, we get the anvil, which drifts downwind. So I'm gonna be talking about the serious microphysical observations closer to convection in the anvil. And then as that anvil propagates downwind, we have lots of dynamical um, processes going on that are gonna change those microphysics. At some point downwind, which there are different definitions in the community, we'll term that an in situ cirrus. So I'm gonna be talking about in situ microphysics far downwind from convection and kind of anvil physics closer to convection. So I'm gonna be presenting results from three campaigns that took place within the last 10 years. Two of them were NASA campaigns. Um, Atrex occurred out of Guam, focusing on TTL Cirrus. Um, Poseidon was also out of Guam using the NASA WB57. They had similar instrumentation, um, FCDP for looking at the small particles, 2DS for looking at the mid-size range particles, and then a cloud particle imager that allows us to get the actual habit of the ice crystals, and that's one of the things I'm gonna focus on in this talk. Also, just give some kind of a teaser of some soon to come work from ACLIP, which was an NSF funded project that had very similar instrumentation. Um, it had two aircraft, the NSF G5, as well as the NASA WB57. The Vienna team is still analyzing the um, cloud microphysics data from the 57, so I'm focusing on the G5 data. One kind of, um, Thing from ACLIP, which is unfortunate for this analysis, is it didn't have a CPI on board, so we can't look in as much detail at the habits, but it's still a very useful data set um, in this context. So if you're not that familiar with the instrumentation, quick overview, CPI gives us really high resolution images from which we can get the actual habit of the ice crystals. The CDP or FCDP is a forward scattering probe that looks at the smallest cloud particles. Something to keep in mind with that instrument, it was designed to measure cloud droplets. So although it sees ice crystals, there's larger uncertainty in the sizing of those ice crystals because it is using assumptions from mu theory and assuming that those ice crystals are spheres. Um, the 2DS gives us those shadow graph images, the black and white images up there, from which we can get some information about that habit um, if they're large enough. Um, but obviously the images aren't near as nice as what we get from the CPI. So with the CPI, um, I'm able to go into this data set and separate out all those ice crystals that we observe into different habits. And these are the habits that I'm looking at. So primarily columns, plates, um, budding and bullet rosettes. And then of course we've got small and large irregulars. And there's another category that I haven't put up here and that's once you get below a certain size, we just don't have enough resolution to distinguish what those are. So I've lumped in another category, all the particles that are smaller than 30 microns. Um, and then I didn't mention quasi-spheroids are another category here. They're not perfect spheroids. They kind of have nubs and nobules. They might be droxtols or budding buckyballs, um, but they're basically roundish in shape. So we'll start with Atrex, which was primarily looking at in situ observations. Um, it occasionally penetrated some, near some convection coming in and out of Guam, but the focus was looking at in situ cirrus that was far downwind of convection. So if we take those size distributions and we segregate them by temperature, proxy for altitude, um, the warmer temperatures are here designated by the warmer colors. Um, colder temperatures, colder colors. So we see as we might expect that as we get to higher altitudes, we get narrower size distributions. We're seeing those larger particles fall out, um, generally kind of smaller concentrations. Um, and as I'll show in a moment, we see very few aggregates and lots of spheroids. Um, so here are those CPI um, images of the ice crystals that, that I've segregated into those different um, habit categories. I know it's kind of a busy figure, so I'll try to walk you through it. Um, on the top is all of the imagery. On the bottom is only looking at the faceted habits, so like the columns, the plates, the rosettes and budding rosettes. Um, and that being because in the top part, we're kind of dominated by the spheroids in these cirrus, as well as irregulars and the smaller crystals. So it's nice to be able to tease out what's actually going on with those faceted habits. Um, and then here I've also put those percentages in terms of the number, the area, and the mass, 
because depending on which of those we're looking at, we can have different contributions from different habits. So what we generally see here is we see the spheroids tend to dominate at the higher, colder temperatures. Um, faceted habits, we get more of them in the warmer temperatures here, and they kind of fall off as we get up to the higher, colder temperatures. So if we take a look at Poseidon, which Poseidon, so I said Atrex was focused on in-situ sampling. Poseidon was kind of more of a mixed bag. We sampled convective near the convection as well as in-situ cirrus. So if we look kind of in the same categorization, what do we see? Um, we generally see, again, we get narrower size distributions as we get up to those colder temperatures, but it's not quite as monotonic as it was with the in-situ data set. In terms of the habits, we again see that we've got quite a lot of spheroids up at the colder temperatures. We again have more faceted temperatures, more faceted habits at kind of the warmer temperatures, and that falls off as we get higher up. So what we then did was we dug into these data sets and we pulled out different cases that were near to convection or far, to, far from convection in situ to kind of look at what the differences were in the microphysics, the habits, the size distributions. So other observationalists have observed this before. This really isn't new, but we're trying to see if there's a better way to categorize these, different, these variations in the microphysics to try to figure out how to best represent these. So what we kind of see is an anvil cirrus closer in. Um, we get a lot of aggregates, larger particles. The columns and plates are generally a bit bigger, a bit thicker. Um, we generally don't see many bullet or budding rosettes. If we move over to the in-situ cirrus further down when, we really don't see the aggregates. Um, there's fewer large particles. They tend to be much smaller, lower concentrations. And we get to see some of these rosettes and bullet rosettes. Um, the plates and columns are also generally a bit smaller, a bit thinner, so some notable differences. Um, something else we started to do with these data sets was take, now that we've classified the habits with the CPI, and we know the size from the CPI, we can project that onto the size distributions measured with the CDP or FCDP and the 2DS to tease out which habits are contributing the, the most to which parts of the size distribution. Um, so here we see that we've got a lot of contribution from the spheres again and the smallest sizes in both cases. Uh, one of the biggest notable differences is we see that contribution from the rosettes and the budding rosettes playing much more of a role in the in situ series. So this is all great and it's interesting kind of looking at case studies, but is there something more kind of concrete or quantitative that we can do with this data? So my colleagues at NASA ran back trajectories, a cluster of back trajectories from the flight track. Um, so here's like just a representative one. They ran back trajectories from the flight track to see where that air mass was last influenced by convection. So here's an example of this white one. It hits convection there. So we have a time of how long it's been since that air mass has been influenced by convection as um, opposed to the black line, which keeps going, it hasn't seen any cloud tops yet, so that would be a longer time since convection. So this just gives us a kind of proxy of how we can start to kind of categorize these observations. So if we go back to our in situ data set and look at Atrex, we wouldn't really expect to see too much of a change with time since convection because, again, it's far downwind from convection. And again, we, we, as expected, we don't really see much of a strong trend. It's kind of as, as we would expect. Um, if we, and I should note, <laughs> because it is so far downwind, here I've separated out that convective influence in terms of days, because we really don't have a whole lot of close-in sampling. At Poseidon, um, I've now changed it into hours because we have a lot more sampling building that data set closer into convection. Um, so we see that as we move further away from convection, as we might expect, we see a narrowing of the size distribution as the largest particles fall out. Um, in terms of the habits, we still see pretty good dominance across the board by the spheroids. There's still some small irregulars, um, particles that I can't categorize because they're too small. Um, but the thing that I think is kind of fun from this analysis is that if we start looking at the faceted habits, so it's been noted that we see these rosettes and budding rosettes. Typically, it's associated with in situ cirrus, but it's not really well known exactly how far down when we might observe them or exactly when and why we see them. 
Um, so this is kind of fun in that we see a regrowth of those rosettes about 5 to 120 hours downwind of convection. So I wanted to plot up the supersaturation data just to take a look and say, is there evidence there that might support growth of these habits? And indeed, between 5 to 120 hours, we do see some pretty high supersaturations that might suggest that growth. Um, so one of my next steps is to dig closer into this data set to see what exactly is causing these rosettes to grow. But as I said, I wanted to dig into a clip um, and just see, we don't have those CPI images, but we do still have good imagery from the FAST2DS. So we ran that same convective influence product and threw it with the ACLIP data set, which sampled both near convection and far from convection, to see if we see similar trends there. And although it's still preliminary, we do see similar kind of narrowing of the size distribution as we get further away from convection. And picking out a couple time periods that are within that recently convectively influenced, as opposed to in that like five to 120 hours downwind, we see a pretty big field of rosettes in that period that's pretty far downwind. So kind of fun and something exciting to dig into as I move forward. Um, so in summary, there's very distinct differences between the nearly actively convectively influenced cirrus clouds and far downwind, which really isn't new. People have noted that for a while. Um, but the fun thing here is looking at that convective influence product, we can actually start to pin down kind of a time frame of when those rosettes might be occurring in the institute, which will be something fun to dig into. Um, so looking to the future, as I mentioned, digging into the dynamics and the microphysics more of that, um, that specific time period. Um, there are also other field projects out there that have similar, similar data sets that haven't been mined for this yet. So hoping to bring in some more of that data to build the data set. And then of course, as an observationalist, there are always more observations on the wish list and improved instrumentation and whatnot. So I'll just throw that up as food for thought and then um, close out with my references to allow some time for discussion. Do we have any questions? Yeah, just as you mentioned other field campaigns, I, I immediately thought of OTREC. And yeah, I think we should look at that together. That sounds great. Were you a little surprised at how small the percentage of rosettes was? And if you went to like that one plot where you said there were more of them, if you look at the numbers, if I'm understanding this right, it was just a percent or two, you know, very small fraction. Yeah. Overall. So that's part of why I presented them as percentages. And one of the things to note here, which is one of the instrumentation shortcomings, is that these observations come from the CPI, which has a sample tube. Sample tube, as soon as you get something that's nice with gangly long arms, like a rosette, um, it's going to shatter on that sample tube. I have tried a preliminary, um, you know, re removing all of these shattered particles, but I think that a large part of all of these ones that are smaller than 30 microns, you'll notice there's a lot more in Poseidon than there were in Atrix. And I think part of that is I'm still getting a lot of contamination from the shattering, which is part of why I wanted to look at the relative percentages of just the faceted habits, because those are still, you know, ones that are together that are not as influenced. There's still a whole population out there that is shattering that I need to deal with. Um, but in terms of the faceted habits, I feel like there's enough there percentage wise that it's still a pretty interesting result. But yeah, great, great point. Thank you. And next is Ulrike. Yeah, so an, another talk about observations, um, remote sensing. And so, yeah, are, are we talking about microphysical properties from airborne radar Doppler spectra? And you can see there's a question mark at the end of my title, because this is really very much a work in progress, and I hope that I can spark some interest within this group that hopefully some will join me in what I'm trying to do. So the data I'm using is from our very own HyperCloud radar um, that um, EOL deploys on the NSF Hyper aircraft, which is the G5 that Sarah also talked about um, just now. Um, HCR is a W-band cloud radar. It has dual Doppler and dual polarization capabilities. The resolution is about 20 meters, so pretty high resolution, um, both horizontally and vertically. 
Um, we usually operate it in steering mode, either pointing up or down, so we can get um, the Doppler um, vertical velocity. Um, but we can also scan, and I think HCR is, as far as I know, the only airborne scanning radar out there. Um, yeah, and we deploy it in an underwing pod so it doesn't take up cabin space. Um, as data, we provide um, the typical radar moments data. Um, and I just want to point out that terminology because I will be talking about radar moments later on too. So the um, standard radar moments are reflectivity, um, Doppler velocity, and spectrum width. But then we have also other radar variables, for example, the um, dual pole linear depolarization ratio. We also interpolate um, error 5 reanalysis data onto the HCR grid to help with the interpretation and analysis of the radar data. And then we developed some scientific products, at which I'm just going to show some examples. So this is the first product that um, I developed, which is a melting layer detection algorithm. And you can see an example here in this um, stratiform cloud, and you can see the melting layer identified here at the bottom in black, and you can see that we also provide the thickness of the melting layer. Um, another scientific product is um, a convective stratiform separation. And so we use reflectivity and radial velocity as our input for that um, algorithm. And then we calculate a quantity that we call convectivity, which is really a numeric value between 0 and 1 of how convective each grid point is. And so 0 is all stratiform, 1 is all convective, and then you can see everything in between. And the unique thing about, yeah, and then we threshold that to provide the more traditional um, qualitative classification into different convective and stratiform categories. And what is unique about this product is that it's vertically resolved, because usually you get those types of separation only on a horizontally resolved um, grid. Um, we also provide particle identification. Um, Vivek mentioned that already before, so I will not go into that, but I just wanted to show one example here. So usually what we do um, with radar is we use the so-called pulse pair technique. We basically calculate the signal complex uh, covariance argument, and we need um, two consecutive pulses. That's why it's called the pulse pair technique. I will not go into the details of that technique, but that's what's usually um, used for radar moments calculations. And so usually you get one value for each radar um, gate. So for each grid box, you get one value, which means we, we average over everything within that volume. Um, and what's also important is to know that um, this technique assumes a Gaussian shape of the spectrum. And as you can see here, I'm showing a pretty typical HCR spectrum. And you can see that it's not particularly Gaussian. It actually has these dual peaks here. And so now imagine we average over that whole volume. Um, we are losing a lot of information. I mean, we are not making use of all the information that's actually in that spectrum, which is why um, people are getting more and more interested in um, looking at the spectra themselves. And so especially from vertically pointing radars, there is a lot more information than what we are currently using. And so they show great potential to derive, um, for example, particle phase, particle size. Then you can go into particle type, maybe, you know, enhance our PID algorithm that we're currently using, and also the more dynamical quantities like air motion and particle fall speed. And another thing that we can do from the spectra is we can calculate higher order moments. So as I mentioned before, so far we use reflectivity, velocity, and spectrum width. But how about skew and kurtosis? And some people have been using that as some groups that Sony Brook, Pavlos Kolias has already been mentioned, and Ed Luke, and they have looked into these quantities. But yeah, people are generally reluctant to use them for two reasons. One is it's difficult to get high quality estimates because the higher the moment, the more it's um, the noise, the handling of the noise is important. And also it's, if you look at spectra, you need to um, deal with the time series data and that's a lot of data. So for example, for Socrates, 
um, we are looking at 30 terabyte of data. And I know for the modelers that may not sound a lot, but for observationalists, that is a lot. And so people generally don't want to deal with that. Yeah, but I think there's a lot of potential there, and that's why we came up with this method to um, process our um, airborne Doppler spectra. And so I'm just quickly describing a method here. I'm not going into the details, but I'm happy to talk with you offline if someone is interested. So the first step is to um, find the spectral noise. I've already mentioned noise is very important when you deal with spectra. And then you, we filter the spectrum and correct for spectral broadening that is caused by the aircraft motion. That's obviously unique to um, airborne radars. So we have a finite beam width. And so when we want to measure the vertical velocity, um, we get this horizontal wind component that causes the spectrum to broaden. And so we need to remove that broadening effect. And then we can calculate the higher order moments. And here at the bottom, I'm just kind of showing these different steps. So the blue one is the, the raw spectrum. The green line here is after filtering. And the red line is after we correct for that um, aircraft motion broadening. And then the, the um, bright blue line is the noise floor that we identify. And you can see here an example of spectrum width before and after we do this processing. And this is an um, interesting case because this was a takeoff. So the aircraft around here, there's almost no aircraft motion. It's slowly moving towards the runway for takeoff. And you can see low spectrum widths. But then after takeoff, when we have when the aircraft speed picks up, then we see this broadening effect. And you see these um, higher spectrum widths, which are artificially higher. And so after we do our processing, you can see this is much improved. It's almost as low as before takeoff. And you can also see that if we deal with the noise appropriately, you can see here at the, at the cloud edges, you have a lot of noise. And that is removed here, too. And then you finally, you suddenly can see these nice cloud features here at the top that are kind of masked by the noise before the processing. So I think we have a much improved spectrum width um, product here. And yeah, as already mentioned, once we've done that, we can then actually calculate these higher order moments. And this is an example from a stratiform case. Um, you can see, or maybe you cannot see, um, the melting layer is around here. So we have, oops, we have a um, cold environment up here and then um, precipitation down here, liquid precipitation. And you can see that we have now coherent, spatially coherent structures in both skew and kurtosis. It's not like people claim, oh, it's too noisy, we can't get anything out of it. I find, I mean, there's definitely information in here. And here's a convective example. So in this case, the aircraft is is down here, and the radar is pointing up. And that, that is an um, example from Specule. Actually, both are from Specule. But this is a newly developing cumulus uh, cloud in its early stages. We have a very strong updraft here. And you can see how skew and kurtosis, how, again, they have these, these very interesting structures. And so this is where I really hope that some of you may get interested to, to help me interpret what that actually means. And so if you um, look at reflectivity on velocity, which is what we are used to looking at, at in radar data, and, and then you add in this improved spectrum width, but then also skew and kurtosis, you can see that there's a lot of structures that you may not necessarily see when you just look at reflectivity and velocity. And so to me, this is very fascinating to just look at these plots. And, and yeah, as I said, I really hope this is a collaborative group. And I really hope that some of you um, may show some interest in, in learning what that actually means. And so my goal is to really run this new processing um, on all of our field campaigns. And you can see we've been in five regions and very different regions of the world. So we have one Northeast event at the US East Coast. Then we did a subtropical campaign. CSAT has been mentioned before. Socrates over the Southern Ocean. We've been to the 
um, to the tropics, and we did this continental field campaign, Specule. So we really have a very wide variety of clouds that we have sampled. And so I hope that by calculating skew and kurtosis and providing that as data sets in, instead of these 30 terabyte raw time series data, that if we actually provide these on a larger scale, that there, there will be more interest in the community to actually look at those and, and figure out um, yeah, what we can do with those products. Other things I'm interested in doing is um, find these regions where we have these dual peak spectra. And you can see I have a prototype algorithm that does that. And you can see this region, for example, aligns with this interesting structure and spectrum width. And again, in skew. So that looks interesting to me. And yeah, there's also ways of retrieving air motion from radar spectra. And here, this line, this is um, in situ ob observations from the G5 gust probe. And so you can see, and then, yeah, on top here is my radar derived air motion. You can see, oh, yeah, this looks quite nice. Um, some, some vertical continuity, but then you look at other cases, like, ah, not so great. So there's, there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, and that brings me to my conclusions. So we developed this process of processing um, the Doppler spectra that seemed to work pretty well and produce nice coherent results. And yeah, and then we calculate these um, higher order moments and we want to do that large scale and get everyone involved in using them. That's the end. Questions? Very interesting talk. I was wondering, so if we want to use model to see what kind of uh, radar signal can tell us about the microphysics, can we use simulator to get those skewness and the kurtosis? And then in that way, if we can get that, we can easily compare it with some microphysic uh, variables and the dynamical variables from the model. So. I think that would be super interesting. I mean, people have done it for the standard moments, right? But I, I don't know if anyone has done it for skewer kurtosis. Yeah, I don't know if there is a capability available for us to directly retrieve those things from models. Then we can do the more detailed study. Yeah, I think, I think you can. It's just a matter of understanding the algorithm you're using and then applying that to the microphysics distributions. But you're right in terms of, especially like the super, super droplet Lagrangian microphysics scheme would be great for interpreting these different features that you're seeing. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Oh, yes. Yeah, so should be the question here. Um, with a skew and kurtosis product, do you think that you are mainly looking at turbulent variability within radar volume or drop spectra fall speed differences due to different drop sizes? Well, that is, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> and I think it really depends on what cloud are we looking at, right? And so I think a part, so for example, these dual peak um, regions I would think those may be representative of two different particle species. And for example, I mean, that, that was what Pavlos and, and Ed Luke, what they did at Stony Brook, is they um, used skew to um, identify regions of drizzle onset. So, so they would have one peak from the cloud and one peak from the drizzle um, droplets. But then here, I mean, this is an example. You can see the melting layer is right here. So this is all probably mostly frozen precipitation. So we are not even looking at, at drop sizes here. We are looking at, and, and so it gets even more complicated. And that's why people so far, they have always concentrated, okay, we are looking at stratus at high latitudes, or we are looking at, um, I don't know, uh, only liquid clouds. And so there are these case studies out there. But yeah, I, I think we should really bring it all together. and. And there's there so much work in there, but I think it's really worthwhile. So, um, Jan, I cannot answer your question <laughs> because we aren't there yet. Thank you. I think we should move on. Oh, one question. Okay. But then we need to move on, I think. <laughs> 
Thank you. So uh, I was wondering, is your uh, this algorithm is it sensitive to like different band of we radar too, or it's just like uh, have you tried with different band of radar? Because right now you're looking at airborne the W band radar, right? Yes, I have not, but that would be. I mean, you know, or you may not know. We are currently de developing the airborne phased array radar. And so this is, of course, highly applicable to that radar, but that's a C-band radar. So this is kind of, yeah, the first test case, a W-band, and then I'm, I'm not claiming that this will work at other um, bandwidths, but yeah, it, I think it's worth looking into. Thank you. Thank you. And last speaker is Masi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I want to talk about uh, char characterizing the role of uh, moisture and smoke uh, on pyrocollective clouds. Uh, this was a part of my postdoc project. Um, and then afterwards, I couldn't continue really. Um, so, uh, with getting. Uh, Fires are getting more attention uh, because of the increasing trend we see in the frequency and the intensity of them. Um, and here we are looking at um, two extreme cases. Uh, the extreme cases are usually uh, either wind driven or plume dominated. Uh, and uh, there is not a good way uh, to um, predict uh, when the fire gets. Uh, plume dominated, which is, can be very dangerous, especially for the first responder in the area. Um, and there is very limited measurement uh, for characterizing these uh, events. So uh, numerical um, modeling uh, was a way uh, to go for me to look at this. Um, a pyroconvective clouds, they form uh, when um, the fire plume has enough moisture when it reaches the satura saturation level. Um, and uh, if, if uh, the plume is diluted, then you wouldn't get uh, the cloud. And when we have the cloud, we have uh, moist convection and uh, um, higher wind intensity. And they are also important in terms of uh, they can inject as uh, as much as, uh, as a, a volcanic eruption uh, uh, aerosols into a stratosphere, so it's very important for the clim climate too. Um, uh, I, I worked uh, with uh, one of the uh, the fire uh, the fire department commander in uh, Spain. Um, uh, uh, to uh, get more information about one of the, the fires called Santa Coloma de Quarant, and you see this this case, um, which is started on the 24th um, uh, of uh, July, and it, it, with westerly winds, um, and the firefighters were able to get there and uh, almost uh, um, contain the fire. Uh, on the 25th, before they had a change in the wind direction, uh, which brought in more moisture. And then they had the, the pyro, a pyroconvective cloud forming, which then was too dangerous for the firefighters. And they had to leave. So you see like the um, these lines are the ISO, ISO contours. You see they're getting smaller here, but then suddenly uh, they get bigger because they had to leave the fire for a while um, and come back to it later um, when the cloud dissipated. Um, this is the actual picture of them um, and getting measurements, um, the sounding measurements, which I got from them. And here you see the solid lines are from the era five, and the, the dotted line is from what they've measured, and they release the sounding inside of the plume. Uh, so you actually see the dew point and uh, the temperature uh, together, which means there is a cloud. But the era five was very dry. Um, so, so I also looked um, at a condition, uh, hypothetical condition where I. Uh, added 20% more moisture 
Um, and then I'll go quickly through this one because um, I also got the fuel characteristic from the firefighters um, and use an average uh, amount, uh, especially fuel moisture is important here because that's another question, whether the fuel moisture is important for the cloud uh, formation or not. Um, in terms of uh, model development, um, I, I wanted to look at the impact of the smoke also, but there is no such a thing in the model. So I um, added that part. Um, the way the model works, uh, I'm using WARF fire. Uh, WARF is uh, the atmospheric part uh, is giving me the wind, um, temperature and pressure, um, and that's passed to the fire module. And the fire module calculates the fire spread and moisture and heat flux from the fire. Uh, the, the thing that I added is that I got the black carbon and organic carbon um, also. And I, I passed those numbers to the um, microphysics as uh, cloud condensation nuclei. Um, um, so the things that I wanted to look at um, was the impact of moisture, the impact of uh, moisture from the atmosphere and of uh, the fuel and then also what's the impact of the aerosols. Um, and what, what I looked at was the dynamics of the fire. How does it change the dynamic, the fire dynamics? Um, and how does it change the cloud uh, microphysics? Um, the way I calculate the, the emissions was based on the mass of how much fuel is burning um, and um, with an emission factor for black carbon and organic carbon. Um, and I remember I, I talked with Truda a little bit, how, how can I put this in the uh, Thompson microphysics? And um, one thing that I considered is that in the beginning, uh, these were hydrophobic. So there is like a ter uh, turnover time to change it to hydrophilic. and. I looked at the literature, there was a lot of different numbers from a few hours to one day. Um, so there is a lot of uncertainty there. Um, and then also the, you need the distribution because you get the mass from the fire uh, module, but the microphysics likes to have the numbers. So you have to go from mass to numbers and then there is another uh, amount of uncertainty in that too. Um, these are my model results. Um, I, I did large eddy simulations and I ran an ensemble because I was noticing a lot of variability. I just wanted to make sure I'm getting correct the statistics. Um, and I have a control run with um, higher moisture and a dry simulation with 20% less moisture, a simulation with the smoke and one without the smoke. Um, I mean, two of them are with the smoke and two of them without the smoke. And here you see the difference uh, in the wind, the speed uh, on the surface when this, with the dry case and with the uh, full moisture case. And you see there is a, with, when we have more moisture, you see a much higher wind on the surface. And that's, that's why this is very important for the fire um, fighters because those winds are very dangerous for them. Um, let's see. Uh, and then I, these are the time series of the same uh, thing, the, the burn area. And you see again for the control and control D, which is a dry case, uh, when we have the cloud, we have the moisture, the, we have a, a larger burn area. Um, I, I'm not seeing a big difference when you have the, at the smoke and when you take the smoke out, um, especially in the dynamics, um, they, there is more difference in the cloud structure, rain, rain and cloud water path. Mm. These are the cross sections in the domain. Uh, so here, for example, is a fire. Uh, and for the case that's dry, you don't see much of water vapor and the higher elevations. When you add more moisture, you see uh, a cloud forming. And I should say these are ensembles, so these are averaged and smoother fields. Uh, 
you see higher winds uh, here near the surface and updrafts for the cloud. Um, and also, there is not not a big difference where where you have a smoke or for the control where you don't have. And the the lower panels are the Q cloud and Q rain. Um, and uh, what what was interesting for me, I looked at the the distribution of the wind uh, below three hundred uh, hectopascal. Uh, and you see an increase um, in the in the tail of the wind speed. Um, again, the smoke is isn't changing much any, anything. It's mostly mostly the moisture. Um, and these are the same uh, average profiles in the domain. Um, I, this is a 99 percentile and one percentile. You, s you see a difference when there is moisture and when there is not. The only things that are different because of the smoke is this green line and red line. Um, it's a, the Q rain and Q cloud and um, Q, uh, Q ice. Uh, or the, I think that's a f some of the frozen particles, actually. And then... Um, I think that's that's another sensitivity analysis that I did. Um, I changed the turnover time because I, I saw a lot of variability in the literature and I didn't know uh, what number to put in there actually. So I, I looked at different numbers. Uh, again, the turn, when you change the turnover time, um, it will change the cloud water path and it will change the rain. There's not much difference in the fire, the burnt area um, and the wind speed. Uh, all, the most important thing, which is like twenty percent, is whether the atmosphere is dry or not. Even I changed the fuel moisture. Um, that wasn't a big. Uh, there was a small uh, difference, but not as much as the atmospheric moisture. Uh, I think that's um, all. So I just summarized my results. Um, the the cloud formation, from what I got from my simulation, it depends mostly on the atmospheric moisture uh, content. And uh, for this a specific case, which is relatively a small fire, uh, the, the smoke didn't make much difference to the fire dynamic. There was some deep, small deep changes in the cloud and uh, Q cloud and Q rain. Um, and uh, what's interesting for me to pursue uh, if I have more resources is, um, look at more realistic cases, bigger fires, um, and include the radiation, which one of my colleagues actually already did. I, uh, we can run with the full radiation, and um, they looked at actually solar energy, and they see, for example, in California, sometimes when you have a fire, you, you get like 60% less energy in the solar panels because of the smoke. So I think that's something interesting to pursue um, looking at with this model. And then uh, ca characterizing a predictive uh, criteria for uh, firefighters to uh, make better decisions uh, in case of the extreme events. Um, and also like air quality um, and one thing that I'm really interested in is to uh, compare my numbers with observations because it, those are very limited to find like a comprehensive observation set that has uh, smoke and cloud and fire dynamics all together. Um, and that's all. Yeah. Okay, any quick questions? We have like five minutes before the top of the hour, so I think we'll end there. I might just say a couple comments. So thank you so much. Okay, so um, thank you everybody who prepared talks today. Um, I know that there's a lot of people who've had to leave because we're kind of into the afternoon time, like child care and other things. Um, we are always thinking of new ways of formatting this workshop. This is our first like true talks type workshop, which I think was really good because we got to see some, some science and talk about science. I also want to say that 
this was a really good example to Yaga of the breadth of things going on at NCAR. Everything from small scale modeling, resolving the temperature of a droplet <laughs> to climate scale modeling with Truda's PPE and observations of in situ individual cloud particles to remote sensing. Like, I mean, this is a huge breadth that is going on at NCAR and it's only seven presentations. So, um, so thank you guys for participating so we can um, share that with Yaga. Um, and thank you, Yaga, for coming. You know, this is a big chunk of time. Um, next workshop, we are aiming for early November, and um, we have more speakers um, listed here. The other thing is I just put on here, are there other suggestions? Like today we had a lot of great discussion and I felt like we had to suppress that because of the time constraints, which was not fun for me because I would much prefer to discuss. So thinking about how to have this as a really open discussion is something that we can um, continue to, we don't have to always do the same format. We are thinking either Wednesday or Thursday, collaborating with either the RAL or MQ or one of the other seminars going on just so that it reduces the time a little bit. Um, but these are just some ideas. So if you have any other ideas for this, please let me know, especially online participants in terms of your preferences with the Slido YouTube streaming versus the Google Hangout that we've used in the previous two workshops. So, uh, well, we were thinking about trying to get similar to, so this is a, a collaborative with the RAL seminar series. So we would ask the MCube seminar to, to use that time slot. Yeah, that's what we would try to do. That day, so Wednesday would be my, okay. well, even on Wednesday, I may not come because we live in on Thursday overseas. Yeah, so. yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll send out a poll to, to gauge what people feel is best with their schedule. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we really only have like five minutes for the top of the hour, and I think people have lives to live, so I don't want to keep people longer. Um, but we do need to still talk about <laughs> kind of where we should head as an institution in terms of microphysics research. And so given that there are half the number of people in the room right now, I'm going to suggest that we find maybe an intermediate time between now and November, and I can talk with Yaga on the timing and time scale that she's working with to kind of have just like a hour discussion. And I think it'd be good for it to be in person um, or hybrid. Um, and then we can specifically talk about that for maybe an hour of time. Does that seem like a good way forward since we weren't, Yaga, go ahead. Oh, here. And I also would be curious, like already what collaborations are going on? Like for example, Ulrika's talk, you know, she was showing radar picture of deep convection, et cetera. And I wish our deep convection in CSM looked like that, but it looks nothing like that. So like what are already the efforts that are, for example, bridging between like EOL and even parameterizing the convection in WARF and MPAS, right? Did we even get that? Is that already a rank, right? Because there's so much I like to really like to talk to Rika, but yeah, like I wish convection looked like that in MPAS and in CSM. Like that would be a great goal. So maybe is this so yeah, summarizing already, that? Like, what, what, what is what already the, where the links are already, so yeah. then where we can strengthen them, so we're yep. not starting from scratch already. Yep. That's good. Yep. We can definitely do that. Okay. Thanks, Yaga, again for being here. And thank you all for being here to the end, the real heroes. I'm just kidding. Um, Cece, do you have anything else that we should add? OK. And to those online, thank you for joining and spending your afternoon with us. Um, and then I think at this point, we can adjourn. And um, feel free to email me or Cece or Truda if you guys have any suggestions. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.